home field for the playoffs is on the line here tonight at Cary Stadium on the campus of Germantown Academy as the Boston Whitecaps have traveled down to take on the Philadelphia Spinners. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Poster, joined alongside by Dusty Rhodes once again in week nine of our MLU season. The Spinners in first place in the East at 6-1, and one, and the Whitecaps right behind them, 5-1 and one in second place. Dusty, this is a pivotal matchup for both teams as first place and more importantly, most likely home field advantage in the playoffs is on the line and no team in the East that has been a visitor in the playoffs yet in the history of the MLU has gone on to win the champ or go to the championship. Yeah, the home field advantages for each team have, have grown every year. The very first year, the Boston Whitecaps uh, dominated the regular season and did the same thing in the playoffs. The next year, people had to travel down to DC. And then last year again, they had to travel up to Boston in an attempt to play. That was the spinners last year. And mm -hmm. thus far this season, these two teams are one and one against each other. So it's the tie break that's going to decide this most likely. It is a very warm night here at Cary Stadium. Beautiful for pretty much anything else you'd be planning to do on a warm Saturday night. We're gonna take a break here and come back and preview this game a little bit more when we get back. Back here at Cary Stadium as the Whitecaps and the Spinners get set to go in what should determine, or most likely determine, the home field advantage of the Eastern Conference Finals coming up here June 25th. It'll be either here at German Count Academy or up at Medford, Massachusetts at Hormel Stadium. And we'll most likely know tonight who will be hosting. <laughs> it should be exciting one way or the other. Exactly, I'm not sure. Yeah where we'll be traveling to yet, but the fact that we're going to get to see these two teams who have proven themselves to be the top of the Eastern Conference this whole season is we'll get this matchup today, and then we'll get a second matchup in a couple of weeks. Both teams are so good at not making unforced errors and then attacking once they're on defense. So once they have an opportunity to get breaks, both of these teams are very successful at it, but Boston's offense thus far this season has been much more confident. Well, it's going to be up to their defense tonight, and one of the guys on the defensive line for the Whitecaps joins us right now, field side, Andrew Hooker. How's it going down there, Andrew? It's going well. It's hot. Looks <laughs> like yeah. it. It feels hot. Yes. <laughs> you guys are well prepared for the heat, I imagine, though, yeah? Yeah, you know, Boston has similar weather, uh, especially playing on turf. The turf tends to radiate the heat pretty aggressively, so uh, it's something we're used to, and it's something we're ready to grind in. And can you tell us a little bit about how important home field advantage is going into the playoffs? You know, it's something that uh, certainly does provide an advantage uh, when you're playing in front of your friends, your family, your fans. Uh, and it's also the comfort of, of being in your own area. Um, at the same time, there's something to be said for the uh, camaraderie on the bus <laughs> on the rides down and uh, getting even closer as a squad. So uh, this game is important for us to get home field advantage, but it's not uh, the end of all things here. So another question that we have for you is generally uh, you seem to be missing a couple players this weekend, speci specifically from your offensive side. Have you adjusted defensively to try to do anything different to compensate? You know, uh, nothing is changing for us on defense. We feel really confident in our defensive squad. We're deep. We can rely on every single one of those guys uh, to get the job done. Uh, for us on it defense, yeah. So, in speaking of that job, is there anything specific that you're planning to do against Philadelphia's offense th today? Uh, it's the same plan we've had uh, every time we've played Philadelphia. Uh, they, they're like uh, post cuts coming across the field, and uh, our job is to shut those down and uh, get a body on, on every guy. Yeah. Oh, well, we look forward to it today. Uh, we're expecting to see a really good show out here today, and good luck out there, and thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right, good luck to the Boston Whitecaps defense and Andrew Hooker. We're going to step away, take a quick break, and come back and preview some of the players to watch in this one.
here at Cary Stadium getting set to go in week nine, the Spinners and the Whitecaps. And Dusty, let's talk about some of the players to watch in this one. First for the visiting Whitecaps, they're going to have to lean on their captain once again, Jake Taylor. He's our guy to watch for for the Whitecaps. And frequently, he can be sort of a bellwether for how their offense is performing. When he performs at a high level, consists a lot of, completes a lot of passes, moves the disc across the field well, they tend to do well in offense. This week specifically, they're missing players like Jared Inselman and a bunch of the rest of their players, their mainstays on offense. So there'll be more weight both on Jake Taylor and Matt Little in, the, in their offensive sets. It sounds like we'll see a bit more of Christian Foster on the offensive yeah. side as well. So we'll see how they weather that. But what the spinners do generally is put a lot of pressure on handlers. So watching how that plays out today will be key to the outcome of this game. And on the other side, a guy for Philadelphia that's garnered a lot more attention as the season's gone on, Ethan Peck, he's the player to watch for the spinners tonight. And the key for him is that he sort of helps their defensive team convert all of their breaks. He's one of the players who sees the field well enough, creates scoring opportunities for their downfield cutters. He leads the league with 13 break assists. And I'm not sure what they're doing in Philadelphia, but they just keep coming up <laughs> with these handlers. Adding him to the team has allowed them to use Nick Hironet and Dave Brandolph and Dave Bayer very well and move them into more natural positions. And they added Isaiah Bryant as well. So adding all of these players in in handler roles makes them very dynamic. The key for them is on the turns, they need to be quick but don't hurry. A key for them is that they attack very quickly after they get a break. They send players like Matt Esther and Greg Martin down for goals right away. But you can get sort of dragged into a trap. If you get over aggressive and give the disc back to Boston, you may not get a second opportunity. Let's get a little more specific on the keys for the whole team in general and taking a look at the keys to the game first for the visiting Whitecaps. You mentioned they're down players, but they gotta have the playoffs in their sight, right? Well, and they make the playoffs every year. Right. This is just an annual thing for them. And it's getting to the point where it's starting to be expected. And the other thing that we're starting to expect repeatedly is at some point during the season, they just start to come together more. They yeah. sort of find their identity. They surge into the game. Uh, the one problem they've had against Philadelphia is that they haven't ever actually had a lead in regulation <laughs> this season against Philadelphia. They're one and one, and the only lead that they had was in overtime right. the last time we saw them up in Boston. So it'll be good for them to show that they can compete with Philadelphia and not rely on that late game comeback. The early part of this game, we'll see how we set up for that. And on the other side, the Spinners determined to get this home field advantage this year. What do they have to do to win this one? Uh, as we mentioned all the time with the Spinners, the key is to ride the brake train. Once they get you down and once they find a way to attack into your offense, they have a tendency to just get brakes on brakes on brakes. If they can make a run early in this game against the Whitecaps, that'll tell us a lot more about how it'll go. Their one concern for them is that after halftime, they do not score very well. Their break margin drops, and Boston has outscored Philadelphia 19 to 13 in the second half this season. So whether it's a matter of adjusting more or better during halftime or sticking with the plan, what we see from them in the second half will tell if they give up enough goals that Boston will be able to make a comeback. Well, both teams getting ready to go here. We're getting ready to go as well. We'll step away. When we come back, we should be getting first pull here at Cary Stadium. It was a huge loss. I just decided to launch and try to get it. I knew if I went up early enough, I could get it. And all of a sudden, there are feet kind of above heads. Does it all come back to this loss? Does it all come back to this play? If I had four hands, I'd put all four hands on. It was up to the other line. They had to deliver. Boston kept doing this thing that we didn't think was possible.
Welcome back to Cary Stadium as we get set to go. The Whitecaps and the Spinners. Jeff Poster, Dusty Rhodes here for MLU Live in week nine. Both teams coming off of victories. Philadelphia last week took down the current and effectively eliminated them from their postseason hopes. 20 to 16 the win. Matt Glazer leading the way. Three goals, two assists. He did 15 and 16 passes and was named the Eastern Conference Player of the Week. As I said it earlier before we got started here tonight, Dusty, he's very quietly put together MVP-like numbers for the season so far. It's it's one of those sorts of players where sometimes you don't know how involved he's been, and then you get to the end of the game and you realize he has six goals, two assists, and has just been right. all over the field, <laughs> just kind of completing passes and ensuring that Philadelphia gets all the way down into the end zone. He's been very good for them this season. You can see him right there on the right side of your screen in Philadelphia's huddle. And Boston on the other side, they had a bye last week, but... They are in a pretty good streak right now. They're riding a four-game winning streak, and they've snapped two undefeated streaks previously. Their last game was a 22-21 win over the Portland Stags in the interconference play, and before that, they defeated Philadelphia and ended their undefeated streak. So they come in hot despite having the week off, but yeah. down many players. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how all this plays out with them. They've got uh, we. For example, they've got Tanner Johnson out there yes, right now. It looks like they'll be starting an offense. Season. That's his first point with this team. And Foster is out there as well on the offensive line. So this is just, a, and Cooper as well. So this is a whole, this is exactly what we're talking about. We're not entirely sure how this team's going to fit together during the game today. Although they've practiced together and they've planned for this game and they knew that a lot of those players are going to be missing, that doesn't necessarily replicate what Philly's going to try to do to disrupt their offense. Yeah, as you take a look, Boston headed out on your screen right now for the pull. Really the only mainstayers there from the offensive line tonight that are headed out there right now are Jake Taylor, Tanner Hulkyard, and Piers McNaughton. Cooper and Foster have been kind of hybrid players. Edmonds has seen a few points on offense. Yeah, and I would expect to see Piers McNaughton have a very big game today as a result of some of these roles shifting around. His speed is something that even if you've played against him before, he can still catch you napping. And if the disc goes up and it doesn't float, he's got enough speed to chase it down anywhere on the field. We'll talk a little bit more about Boston's makeshift offensive line as we get going. And they have the disc moving Right to left across your screen, there's McNaughton on cue making that catch. Puts it up to Hulk Yard. Boston in their white jerseys with the blue numbers and trim. Philadelphia in the blue tops with the white numbers and the red shorts. McNaughton lunges up for the grab, trying to get around his mark. And up to Thomas Edmonds. Edmonds finds Jake Taylor on a nice cut. Taylor looking for the end zone, and that one just out of the reach of Alex Cooper. That's exactly the sort of turnover that we're concerned about seeing from a player like Taylor, who's so consistent most of the time. Uh, Boston there had a bunch of deep shots early to Johnson, but they didn't take them. If they don't take those shots at some point during this game, Philadelphia will start to feast on those underneath. Bryant starts it up to Peck, who finds Lindsey. Now Bryant back. Bryant has been a great addition here for Philadelphia this season on D-line handler. It's a very good sense of what he needs to do in order to complete passes and keep the offense running. Puts that one in a tight spot as David Shields reels that one in. And that one skied up, taken away by McNaughton. That's a big play for Boston. That means they're already going to have a, another opportunity to score this hold, and they're going to need to keep it away from Philadelphia's defense. McNaughton on the far side as wind is picked up a little bit. A cross breeze finds Edmonds right on the goal line. And then Edmonds, the short pass, and Boston goes in for the score. Cooper gets it this time. Yeah, that was a lot of Piers McNaughton, as we were yep. talking about a little bit before that. He seems to be taking on sort of the primary cutting role. That's in part due to a player like Alex Chan, I mean, not Alex Chan, Tyler Chan not being here today. So there's a lot more space for the rest of these players. Alex Cooper hits the goal. That's his seventh of the year. He'd been missing, actually, in the last two matchups. So while Boston is missing a core chunk of their offense, they have gotten a couple of players back in Cooper as well as Rob Baker should be playing tonight. John Hirschberger out, could be potentially limited with a bit of an ankle injury, but is out on the field and looks to be ready to pull. And they get the debut of Tanner Johnson after he finishes up his run at College Nationals with UMass. Ah, uh, the Zoo Disc. That's right. Yeah, 
they didn't have quite the results that they were hoping for, no. but <laughs> you're you're literally at the best college tournament in the world there. So anything can happen. You're playing against a number of other teams who are fighting for it just as much as you are and proven have have, have already proven themselves. This one will hang a little bit here. Nick Hairnet tracking it, lets it fall in front of him, and we'll pick it up as we get our first look at Philadelphia's offense. Similar situation to last season, Boston and Philly were fighting for home field advantage and Philadelphia had to make the travel up to Boston and the Whitecaps blew them out. We'll see if it happens in that same fashion with Philadelphia, the home team this time around as Panna gets that catch. Panna uncorks, looking downfield for Radoms. Hirschberger and Radoms in a foot race. It's gonna hang and Radoms with his body in front and he's got Dave Bear ahead of the pack in for the score. And we've seen multiple times over the season that Radoms is a legitimate deep threat, even when he's covered by three or four defenders in the sort of jump ball situations at the end of a quarter or a half. In this scenario, he made a good, solid deep cut. Panna put the disc out in front of him, and Radoms actually slowed down just enough so that Hershberger couldn't get a good jump on the disc. Uh, neither one of them actually got that high, but all you have to do is control the space around you land the disc in, Bayer made a good job, did a good job following the disc down to make the easy goal happen. The Radom is a pretty good box out against Hirschberger. Two guys basically the same size out there. <laughs> Radom 6'6", six, six. Hirschberger two inches shorter at 6'4". <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, those are both just big boys yes. playing out there on the <laughs> field. For a little guy like myself, I don't want to see either of those matchups going downfield in my neighborhood. So we're tied up here at one. 8.02 left to go in the first. Edmonds reels in the pull and finds Taylor. Taylor fakes a big huck. Was looking at Hulkyard going downfield. Hulkyard and Tom O'Connor, a pretty good matchup. Some more big bodies. It's an opportunity there for Bloodgood to get the block. And then there was almost another D Vendetta earlier on the field. Yeah. Against Misha Herskew, another one of Boston's regular D-line guys coming over to the O-line as this one is put up by Edmonds. He had two Boston guys deep, but instead it's Philadelphia who's deeper. And there's a call. Some sort of call was made here. There's at least a stoppage. Um, we'll get it sorted out here for a moment, but Boston's offense is looking disoriented right now, out of time. Uh, I'm not sure if it's due to the players that they're missing or if it's due to what Philadelphia is playing, the way Philadelphia is playing them. James Kulinski, Noel Polsky, Bill Kane, Brian Monk, J.B. Harrington, and Dina Napolitano, who is operating the clock. That's your referee and crew tonight. Kulinski, the head ref here in Philadelphia. As Philadelphia takes over. Philadelphia is getting some good, deep looks right now, but they're not rushing to take those shots early. That's Colton. Match up with McNaughton. Gets it up to O'Connor. O'Connor sends a flick. This is contested, and Christian Foster... So I guess what you could expect from Boston is they've got their D-line players out on offense. They should be able to get the disc back if they turn it over. And they look good defensively the first time after their turn as well. So we will see a lot of back and forth, it looks like. There's just enough win that there will be a couple extra turnovers. Taylor will send it deep. This time it will be Hulkyard trying to deal with O'Connor. Hulkyard catches it. Was he inbounds? No. Yeah, he was just out of bounds there. It was trailing a little too far in the direction that the wind's going there, so it got sailed out a little bit. Wasn't able to get his toes down. Colton, pick it back up, start off again. Yeah, he's not actually at the correct spot here to start the play because he needs to be actually on the sideline, and they're moving the pylon out of the way. He got an extra yard there or so as a result of moving off the side. So now they're actually going to be a 10-yard penalty because he didn't come in at the right spot. So he'll be in the middle of the end zone now. He's trying to get it to Jack Casey, and he does again. Still deep in their own end zone. Casey swings it over to Patel. Patel left unmarked, back up to Colton. And, well, it was out of the end zone briefly as Vendetta gets it, and we have a pick downfield. It's a defensive foul downfield, defen okay. yeah. Philadelphia's working out of a bit of a side stack here. They're creating a lot of space on the open side, and that's Bounce. just a drop. Just slips through O'Connor's hands, gives it right back to Boston. Cooper will walk up and pick it up against Bloodgood. Nope, he's going to walk past it. Jake Taylor will take it with Casey on the mark. Edmonds fighting for space. Taylor shakes him off, gets it over to Herskew. Hulk yard to Foster. Foster sends a cross field hammer looking for McNaughton. He's got it. 
Two to one, Boston on the beautiful hammer from Christian Foster. And that was pretty much a textbook offensive point for a vertical stack offense like Boston was running there. So they had a bunch of handler motion during the front of the stack, then swung it wide all the way across to the other side of the field, which opened up the backdoor hammer for uh, the toss to McNaughton. This is the first turn. Yeah, I agree. That was a block there. I don't think that he had enough control over the disc to state that Foster shouldn't have gotten the block. I like the fact that that wasn't called a catch and strip. We see McNaughton there. Uh, he is stepping up so far, and we like to see that because somebody was going to have to do that for the Boston offense. But as we talked about before the game, the key for this is that Boston needs to stay on defense as mm -hmm. much as they can. If they're going to win this game, it won't be on their offensive structural structure. It'll be on what their Times. defense could, can do against Philadelphia. And Boston under head coach Sam Rosenthal in his third season. He's a 19-10 overall record with an MLU championship under his belt, assisted by Tom Matthews and Mike Miller. Philadelphia, Daryl Stanley in his first season, 6-1. and one. That's their record coming into the night. Paul Manecci, Steve Weary assisting as this one will hang. Billy Sickles there underneath. And coming up behind was Sean Doherty. Maybe caused just enough contact to avoid a foul and get Sickles out of rhythm. Well, the disc was hopping around in a lot of different ways there. I don't think either player read it perfectly. And uh, it just hung up too far. If it had been a perfect throw, it would have been out in front of Sickles and not made him go up one-on-one -on -one against another player. Ryan Richardson's got it over to Doherty. Grabs it with his left hand as he slides down to the ground. Doherty and Sickles was one of the matchups that Sam Rosenthal told us before the game they were going to try to go to. Trying to take Sickles and Glazer out of the offense as best they can. Stevens finds Braz, the former spinner. And it looked like on that play design that Philadelphia is trying to keep Sickles involved. So we should see a lot of that matchup going back and forth throughout the game. Sam Richardson with the disc. Looks to the end zone, Whitehead, he's got to jump on it. It might carry out the back. He tiptoe the line. No, he's out the back too. Gave it his best effort to try and stay in bounds. There was not a lot of room there at the end well, of the end zone. There was a lot of sp open space there for the throw to go up into, but it just sailed too far out. It, there wasn't enough control. He does, did a valiant effort attempting to get his toes down, and while they stayed on the ground, he just wasn't able to keep wasn't him inside keep the him line. In yeah. <laughs> Randolph will take it back up to Glazer. Hearing it, hearing it, faking a big huck, trying to get around Braz. Glazer with a one-handed grab, sends it over to Arcada. Philadelphia, without the services of Himalaya Meta, broke his hand, and Doherty, I think, <laughs> got a hand on that one. Uh, I think Sickles just well. lost control of it. As we've mentioned before, that m that's a high candidate for the throw of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Stevens will pick it back up. Richardson saying he got smacked by Glazer. I don't think he got bumped, and he may have actually already had the uh, the catch made there. Didn't seem to be attacking the disc too hard, but he's going to get the call in his favor from J.B. Harrington. Okay, so they're saying that he didn't actually make the catch, and it was just a foul. So it's a spot foul. That means they don't get the extra 10 yards. But will retain possession. So Richardson has it now. He'll try to send it around to Braz. Hairnet coming over, misjudged it. Braz able to track it down. Richardson's got it. Stevens. Stevens looking to the end zone, and there's Doherty. So if you give Doherty, if he got a block there, I don't know what the official stats <laughs> are, would end up being bookends for him, but I think you're right, Dusty. I think Sickles just threw that one away. Boston gets their first break. Take a look again. Here's Whitehead, almost very close, but. Yeah foot came up just at the end there. He was so close. The ref was right in position, and here we see Sickles just, yeah, that's, he's attempting to fake it there. He's not even trying to throw it. Just came right out of his hands. And this is where we see Doherty. He's the, their team leader in break assists. So, and the last time that they played, he did very well getting a Callahan in four breaks. So you see Doherty getting the goal from Stevens. They're two of Boston's top defensive line players since a lot of their top defensive line guys are now switched over to offense. How much do you think that affects the way their defensive strategy goes into it? Well, in talking with Coach Rosenthal before the game and in talking with Hooker in our interview pregame, it sounds like they're just going to stick with their same general plan and trust their depth to, get to carry them through. Over the course of the MLU, Boston has consistently been one of the deepest teams in the league on either coast. 
So the opportunity to build that roster over four years and maintain and teach your players how to play in your system, that gives you an advantage in a game just like this one. Well, speaking of top line defensive guys coming back in, Boston uses their first time out, and Christian Foster is out there for the midfield pull, gets it behind Philadelphia's line, and they'll start from the back of the end zone. It's quite well placed. They're in the corner and all the way back. Bryant is out there with the offense. Well, that was very long point on a hot night. Looking for Esser, trying to track this one down. Esser, he's got a beat on Foster. Now he's got to wait for his offense to catch up. And this is mostly the D-line for the spinners. Esser sending it out, reaching up, but there in the back is Peck on the second chance. We've already seen a couple of those that the wind has floated up, and the second guy comes over and gets it, and Peck this time, he gets it to make it three to two. When we talk about this consistently, a whole game can change on your ability to stick with the disc and give a second chance effort. In this case, it was just the first couple players misreading it, the disc hopping around a little bit, but you have to be there to clean up the garbage. Here's the big huck from Bear again. It's a nice touch, a uh, nice toss out there, a good touch on it. Uh, the whole crowd here was sure that Esther was going to have to lay out for that, but he's got enough speed and it was a soft, softly enough thrown disc that he could catch up to it and make an easy catch. Well, Peck was our player to watch tonight for the spinners, and he's got his first point of the evening. And usually he's on the other side of it, uh, throwing those goals, but here instead he's cleaning up the, the mess to get his seventh goal on the season. Yeah, seventh goal, 23 points on the season for Ethan Peck. He's got 16 assists to go, and he's quietly, as a lot of the spinners have quietly, had a very good year. Pull carries a little bit towards the near side. Cooper tracks it down, finds Taylor. Boston working out of a horizontal stack here. McNaughton's got it and quickly double teamed. That leaves Herskew open and there's a foul. Yeah, it looks like we should have just have that throw stay where it's at. So I'm not sure what yep, the stoppage yep. is for. Kowinski's bringing him back. They're gonna give it to McNaughton and they're just gonna give him the 10 yards. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I would have liked to see that play continue on through, but we're pretty much in the same spot for Boston. Cooper has it. The disadvantage you have there is that you split the double team and you put those two defenders out of position. By having a stoppage, you allow those two defenders to get back into the play. Big lunging grab from Hulkyard. Tanner to Tanner right there, Johnson and Hulkyard. Taylor's got it now, threatening for the end zone. Double teamed by O'Connor and Casey has to dump it way back to Edmonds. Philadelphia did a good job of getting out of that double team back into their matchup man defense here. Now Taylor finds Johnson. Johnson is doing a pretty good job there on his defender breaking ankles on Leon Chow. Gives him the space and he gets his first point of the season as he throws it in to Hulkyard. The key there was that Chow was expecting the thrower to go back into the offensive set and look for a swing pass. So he jumped all the way around after this fake. Oh, this is the catch for by Hulkyard first, but we'll see here where Chow expects that they're trying to get back across the field, and that opens up the whole inside break lane for the thrower to make an easy pass, and the defender in the end zone, if you have to cover the entire end zone, is not going to have the opportunity to stick with it. Maybe there's something in the name, both <laughs> having two Tanners on the same it's team. I believe they just met this morning, <laughs> too. So, I mean, there's, there's got to be something there. <laughs> and were you introducing them on the bus as, as we came on all the way down just to make sure the new guys knew everybody, <laughs> making them possibly. feel comfortable? <laughs> Tanner Johnson was, ex was supposed to be, I believe, at their practice on Wednesday. He was sick, though, during the week. Yeah. Couldn't make it. So he's here thrown right into the fire as Sam Rosenthal's counting on him tonight. To be fair, he did play with the team he last year, team so last it's year. not totally unheard of to, put, to be put right back into the fray. One of the upcoming young players here, in the, at least in the Boston area, in ultimate. Here's Hironet. It was, good Panna. it was good work by Panna there. The offense was out of sorts. Panna looking deep. He's got his man. It'll trail over as grabbing it is Arcata on the goal line and then Doherty trying to get in front of Sickles but Billy with a good box out and the two of them high five each other and Sickles gets the goal. It's a good effort there by Doherty to try to stop the play that he knew was coming but it was perfectly placed and there was enough space created by uh, Sickles' body that you couldn't actually get there. This pass has to be right on the spot because Doherty is laying out before it's thrown. He just can't get there though. Very close. 
We're going to see how Sickles deals with this matchup. As you were saying, uh, we should keep an eye on that during the course of the day. And It's already been great. Yeah. <laughs> we're only a few points in. So 27 seconds just left in the first quarter. Yeah, and this is that moment where what Boston has to do is not give Philadelphia a break opportunity, but they really want to get one more goal under their belts before they get into the second quarter. However, rushing into that goal is one error that you can make, but staying, getting too far outside of your offense and trying to milk the clock a little is the other error that they could potentially Just make Just like here. you said about Ethan Peck in our pregame, be quick, but don't rush. <laughs> That's an old John Wooden quote. It's key. It's about the way you play at your speed and do it quickly, but don't rush into things. Johnson gets it to Herskew. We're down to 15 seconds. Herskew up to Hulkyard. Hulkyard sends it around to the far side. That's Foster. Plenty of space. No mark on him yet. And now Foster, the big OI flick across the field looking for the end zone. There's a pile up, and it's caught and taken away by Philadelphia. I believe that... There's Esser. Yep. He was in the front of that uh, pile there. Did good job getting uh, positionally aware. The, it was an interesting choice there by Foster to just hold the disc for a while and then put it up to the far corner. There's a lot of options there that could have come down with it for Boston, but it needed to be deeper in the end zone a little bit. So that's the way the first quarter comes to a close. Boston will take a 4-3 lead into the second. Team of the day is just to have as much fun as possible. It's an experience, man. You turn around and you look and there's this big giant animal running towards you. When I first started commentating, it was kind of tough for me because it's like, well, geez, I can be out there too. I can play with these guys. Well, why am I up here in the booth? Jeff Grant is, is he's a freaking monster. Uh, he can sort of just do it all, you know? A few of my tunes were like, we saw you on the bus. I'm like, I don't ride the bus. No, you're on the side of the bus. Canterbury is proud to power your game and as the official apparel sponsor for Major League Ultimate. Visit www.canterburyus.com today, the destination for your team's custom uniforms. Canterbury, committed to Ultimate. Do you have a team trip or corporate outing coming up? If so, charter a private bus, minibus, or party bus from busrental.com, a U.S. Coachways company. Bus travel is one of the safest, greenest, and most affordable ways to get your group to an event. If you're going with a group, trust busrental.com. Enter coupon code MLUBUS and get additional savings and VIP treatment. Oh, you got to go with the VIP treatment. Of course. At least, <laughs> well, it's one of two things with VIP treatment. You're either a very important person or if you're being picked up by a taxi or the like late at night, you can be a very intoxicated person <laughs> and they just use <laughs> VIP to make you feel special. Same, same initials. <laughs> Uh, so what we saw in the first quarter there is a lot of disorganization on Boston's offensive line. That sort of set the tone for their starting point, but now they've had a chance to step off the field, collect themselves a little bit. But Philadelphia also has to be kind of smelling blood right now. Yeah. There's a little bit of blood in the water, and we're going to see if they have a way to take advantage of that. Uh, however, Philadelphia's offense hasn't entirely looked rock solid either. And whether that's due to Himalaya Meta not being able to play with his injured wrist or hand, I'm not sure which of the two, uh, or whether it's just something where they'll figure it out as we go, I'm not sure. But what he tended to do for the field was just make these big, huge he cutting cuts. Yeah, yeah, and just push downfield, came all the way back underneath. And it took one of the defenders uh, out of the rest of the play for them. You have to match somebody up on him who's just going to run tirelessly. It looks like they're going to be using Radoms a little bit more, who's a little bit more of a deep threat, actually, because he's so large. But I'm not sure he has the same uh, notion of having so much motion in the offense. 
Well, four to three, your score as we get set to start the second quarter of action. Jeff Poster, Dusty Rhodes, glad you could join us on our live stream here in week nine, of the MLU season. We're hard to believe we're already at week nine and talking about the playoffs. The playoffs are effectively set, at least they are in the east. It will be Philadelphia and Boston. It's just a matter of where it will be. Out west, San Francisco has the most smallest of shots to still make it, but it's still there. They're still technically alive, and they need to catch up to the Seattle Rainmakers, who they face this very weekend, yep. uh, and they'll need to sort of win out against them. They'll get two more opportunities to play against the Rainmakers, and the Rainmakers will also have to play against Portland. So That's if right. they can win those two, and Portland will give Seattle another loss, most likely, then uh, San Francisco can be in the conversation. A long way to go, but still can technically do it. So here we go, Boston pulling now to start the second quarter. Victor Lua, who was a question mark coming into tonight with a back injury. I like the pull, it set up very nicely, got the defense to an opportunity to get down. And he did just that, as soon as Bear caught it, he was right in his face for the mark. And we have a whistle, all ready to start the second quarter, and this one is against Philadelphia. And it looks like they're calling it against Glazer, and if that's the case, that's, that's actually his first foul this entire season. That's impressive. I was writing about that this past weekend, and it was just amazing. There were a handful of players who have played almost 150 minutes, and he's one of them who just hasn't given up a foul the whole season until maybe just now. Randolph has it. Drops it back to Bear. Finds Panna. Bra's over on Panna now. Had been with Huronet. Bear's got it. This is Radoms. Structurally, Philadelphia's offense is a little bit confused right now. They started out in a side stack and had a lot of space to work with, had that foul call. But right now, they're in a little bit of a messier offense. They get Rob Baker on the bump, which gives them 10 yards. Baker's first game back since Boston's win over DC almost a month ago. And Jordan Taylor is the one matching up on Glazer, and he's making a lot of contact happen. Terry Roth bids against here, and that comes up short. Nick's got it. And by making a lot of contact happen, what I mean is he's playing solid, tight defense. Well, he was one of the guys, and now it's a tip from Radom's to Glazer. I don't think it was intentional, but it worked. Went right to him. <laughs> it's like that touch pass in basketball. Eventually, maybe that'll be part of the game. Radom's has got it again. Philadelphia doing a lot of work here is Ethan Thornton, who has been inactive for the last couple of weeks for the spinners. Gets a touch. Bear. Bear sends a flick out to Panna, and Panna with bras draped all over him comes down with the score. It's a very good job by Panna to, we talked about boxing out earlier. This is another perfect example of boxing out. What Panna did is realize that the defender was directly behind him, and he was totally in between the path that Bras was gonna have to take in order to get to the disc. So he actually slowed down a little bit, and- There's that touch. Yeah. Good focus there <laughs> to keep it in. And you see him slow down here, and Braz can't get his feet right. Gives his best effort into a bid there. Also does a really good job not getting caught up with Panna's legs on the bid. It's really difficult in those scenarios, but it's on the defender to not cause any undue contact. Well, they're old friends. <laughs> That's what happens when you, when you start switching teams. You right? start seeing the same players <laughs> all over the place. That ties the game up at four. Two points nearly gone during that first point to open up the second quarter. 8-10 left. Philadelphia really had to work for that one. Yeah, it, was good. it was good for them to stick with it, but it was difficult sledding. Good to see a couple of players who have been injured for chunks of the season back out for both sides. Ethan Fort and Rob Baker were both out on that point. Cooper's got it here for the Whitecaps. Sends it up to Foster. Wow. Piers McNaughton is really fast. He's just pulling away <laughs> from the guys who are covering him at different times. Right now it's McCutcheon, but... The fact that they didn't throw it didn't Edmonds mean he wasn't open. Edmonds is another quick one as he takes off for the end zone, dealing, and it's knocked away by Shields. It's an excellent defensive play by Shields. Caught up to it, took the inside route, and right here, this is what Edmonds really could have used what we were talking about earlier, boxing out, getting yep. his body in there so that Shields couldn't catch up to him and launch towards the disc. Shields is going to start this one off. Picks it up, sends it over to Esser. Esser and Foster is another good matchup tonight. 11 on 11. That's right. McCutcheon, first touch for him. Back to Esser. Esser, a little bit of a body check there from Foster. And now we get a call. 
It looked like the call was on Taylor coming through there, making a bit of contact after SR already had the disc. And more whistles downfield. There's a pick yep. against Philadelphia. We'll be losing 10 yards here. Philadelphia and Boston will get a chance to catch their breath here as Esther's taking his time walking back. Esther finds Peck right on the sideline. It was interesting. Boston had the perfect poach defense set up to stop that play, but they didn't commit to stopping the throw to Peck. Brian sends it over to Martin. Martin looking for the end zone. It floats, and then McNaughton it must have come up with it, but it looked like McCutcheon just knocked it down. I, I think McCutcheon was surprised at where the disc ended up there and should have had the catch, but didn't do it. Hulkyard sending this one deep. It's a little bit short of the end zone, but Johnson gets it anyway. Peck made a, a bid for it. Johnson Peck. drops it back for Foster. And Peck had the opportunity. And now Foster sends a blady hammer across, and he finds Tanner Johnson, gets to finish what he started. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that seemed to be sort of a bailout choice by Foster, but the precision with which he put that throw over to the far side made sure that the defense didn't have an opportunity. And we get a second look here at what's going to be a drop for McCutcheon because he gets one hand inside of it there and just he almost could have caught that with two instead of just going up with one. McNaughton gave a lot of pressure, however. Right. I'm not sure if McNaughton actually had a hand on it or not. He definitely caused McCutcheon to you know, aggressively go at it and ends up with the drop, but either way. Yeah, as we went back and looked at it, I think he may have gotten a hand on it, but I'm not entirely sure. It's a little difficult yeah. to tell. It was a mess. That throw needed to be better. It needed to be further away from the defense, leading back towards the back corner of the end zone. But Greg Martin known more as a goal scorer as than a goal thrower. So Boston retakes the lead 5-4, to four and they've got to be happy to see Tanner Johnson back on the field, and he's already gotten a goal and assist. It's a good way to reintroduce yourself to your teammates. Pretty good pull from Boston. This one's still hanging up there. Panna tracks it down. Up to Brandolph. So the side stack here for Boston. We're working a couple switches underneath. It's given a couple free looks underneath for the spinners, however. First point for Katzenbach as he got that pass and then sent it up to Sickles. There's Fortin. Taking it from Arcata. Back to Panna. Randolph doing some work for that B dump. Yeah, Philadelphia is just out of time. They're doing a good job with their handlers maintaining possession. Thornton stall count getting up there, and it is a stall. Yeah, this is what we're saying. Their, their offense is just out of time right now. Timeout called. Did Daryl Stanley get that timeout in? He did, so we'll take it too. It's five to four Boston here midway through the second. That was an incredible game to watch. It was a huge loss. I just decided to launch and try to get it. I knew if I went up early enough, I could get it. And all of a sudden, there are feet kind of above heads. Does it all come back to this loss? Does it all come back to this play? If I had four hands, I would put all four hands on. It was up to the other line. They had to deliver. Boston kept doing this thing that we didn't think was possible. Back here at Cary Stadium, the spinners getting their timeout just in time before stall seven. The nick of. Exactly. <laughs> 525 left to go, and Boston with the lead. And a lot of it has to do with their captain, Christian Foster. Had a couple of nice throws here tonight. And here I expect we're going to get a look at his first block on the yep. evening. And he's had a couple of big hammers. I was going to say, I think both of these assists yeah. that we're going to get a look at are these over-the-top throws where the defense is over-committing to the open side or to the strong side with the, the side with the disc, with the side the disc is on. And then Foster recognizes that, puts it up to the far side, trusts his receiver to catch it. But those receivers really haven't had to move too far. They've been right on, right on point from Foster. It looked like he threw it from basically the same spot and to the same spot both times. The second one was just slightly deeper. It's a well-designed offense to create the space on the far side, and we've actually seen Foster throw a number of hammers and a number of blades, those uh, throws that use the, the, the disc's ability to go up and come down right on a very particular spot. So first timeout taken by Philadelphia. Boston used one of their 20-second timeouts to take that midfield pull. Five to four lead, Boston on top, 5.25 left to go. 
And I would imagine very high up in the stall count when we resume play. Well, the timeout resets that. That's though. true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they'll get <laughs> back in at zero. Off my game there. And they'll, uh, they'll have the opportunity to set up a play here. And it'll be Brandolph who picks it up instead. Fortin actually, I don't believe, nope, he came off. Setting up in a vertical stack straight downfield here, and I'm expecting something, some action from the front of the stack to start. Well, that's Sickles right at the front. Radoms is in the back. Sickles makes a first cut, now heads deep, and they go to him. It won't carry all the way into the end zone. So he's got to hang up and wait for his offense. Panna coming over. Sickles getting turned around, and it's deed up. Victor Lua gets an outstretched left hand and knocks it away. And Boston has a whole fresh defensive line out here. And Braz wants to send it deep. Sam Richardson is back there. Sickles is there as well. It's timed, and it's knocked away. Bodied out by Sickles was Richardson. It's a little antsy by Boston. They rushed downfield there. It was a decent cut, but not a great cut. It was so far away that the throw couldn't get past the defender. Radoms has it back. Layout bid from Boston's Dylan Wolf as Brandolph sends a backhand towards the end zone. Stevens tries to jump up for that one. A little too early, and Panna ends up with a goal. It's the classic experienced player read there to make it look like he's going up early by sort of settling and getting his foot down into the ground. The defense goes up early, and then the offense can just sort of ride the disc out into the end zone. This turnover earlier on from Sickles was just a thing where he was trying to get a little too cute with this pass. He lofts it up to his receiver, and Luau re recognizes that early, gets his hand out and slaps it down. If he had thrown it directly to him with a little more pace on it, there wouldn't have been a chance for a defense. So I think the name of the game for Philadelphia thus far tonight has been boxing out players. Panna back-to-back <laughs> -back goals there did the same thing, and Sickles was able to get the better positioning on Richardson for the D that set up the goal. Yeah, it was good play by Sickles. Uh, as you can see, the Philadelphia players there on the sideline putting ice on their necks, trying to stay cool. They've, yep. They have been out here for basically the entire time we've been out That's here, right. and the production crew has been out here. Yeah, Boston, clinic. on the other hand, was staying inside in the locker room, keeping out of the sun. I'm not sure if it's just because they have fewer players or because they're from so far north that they're not used to this <laughs> much bright sun down here. Vendetta with the, the big... Uh, Technically, it's an OI pull. It would have been an <laughs> out-of-bounds wasted pull there. Instead, it looks like they weren't given the okay to throw, so they should be taking a penalty here of some kind. Yeah, and they took their 20-second timeout for a midfield pull, and now they've got to basically do a three-quarters of the length pull. Well, maybe that'll give them a little more space so they don't throw it too far out the back or anything like that, but that pull that just there, he's got to do a better job than that last pull because that was out-of-bounds clearly. He's going to try it the same way. Certainly better. Sits very nicely on the far side. Edmonds tracks it down, gets it up to Taylor. Boston's out of the end zone. McNaughton has it. McNaughton sends one deep for Tanner Johnson again. He's got a beat on Lindsay. Tracks it down, waiting for the rest of his offense to catch up. Johnson has a very long stride. Yeah, and I don't think Lindsey was quite prepared for it. McNaughton, on the other hand, was ready for it. He looked like he wanted to throw that as soon as he saw that Johnson was far downfield and even with his defender. If he's even, he's leaving. Cooper with a lot of space from Brian, and Edmonds knew he threw the goal before Cooper had even caught it. Well, the only, <laughs> the only possible downside there is if your teammate makes an unconscionable drop in the end zone, <laughs> you look like you're celebrating a little out of character. But... It was a nice, easy play at the end of this. Ran it all the way out to the far side. Easy catch, lost his defender. That's the way that Boston wants their offense to look. So Alex Cooper gets the goal, and we'll take a break here. It's 6-5, to five, Boston back on top of Philadelphia. Back here at Cary Stadium, 6-5, to five, the score, Boston on top of Philadelphia and using another 20-second timeout to set up a midfield pull. Looks like Eric Stevens will be doing the honors this time. 
4.04 left to go in the half. Yeah, Philadelphia looks uh, like they're setting it up so they have four players on one side, three on the other, but this looks like it's just going to ride out of bounds. Yep. We've seen less of this as the season has gone on and players get more used to the midfield pulls, practice it a little bit more, but every time I see somebody just throw it off the field, it's so it's just you're wasting your team's time out. You won't be able to use one to maintain possession like Philly did a little bit ago, and you won't be able to take full advantage of your opportunity to pin the team back in the end zone. And kind of surprising from a guy like Stevens. He's, he's done it before. Normally it's Foster the go-to for Boston as they get it right back anyway. Penna just fell over there after the disc was being put up. Baker gets the catch D. He's got it again, sends it back to Hooker. Guess it was the right decision to pull out of bounds. I don't know how he knew the player was going to fall over like and that. Stevens finds Terry Roth. <laughs> so maybe Eric Stevens was at his plan the whole time. Maybe he can see into the future. And it's a little pressure. Assist. But that's a nice, easy break there for Boston after the total slip and fall down from Panna. And this assist, there's so much space on the far side of the field. Uh, Katzenbach was totally unable to keep up with Roth, breaking all the way back across the back of the end zone. Terry get, Roth gets the goal. We take a timeout. It's 7 to 5, Boston. The team in Italy is just to have as much fun as possible. It's an experience, man. You turn around and you look and there's this big giant animal running towards you. When I first started commentating, it was kind of tough for me because it's like, well, I can be out there too. I can play with these guys. Well, why am I up here in the booth? Jeff Grant, is, is, he's a freaking monster. Uh, he can sort of just do it all, you know? A few of my students were like, we saw you on the bus. I'm like, I don't ride the bus. No, you're on the side of the bus. Back here at Cary Stadium, Boston using their third timeout. Why not get another midfield pull in there? See who's going to be pulling this time. Christian Foster is on the field, so I would assume it's him. Imagining that. <laughs> as he picks up the disc. Yeah. I started to say, as Stevens made that midfield pull go out of bounds, kind of surprising. He has done it before. Normally it's Christian Foster. Ben Katz is kind of the next man up for them if Foster is not on the field, but he is out one of the many inactives for Boston today. Go down that list quickly. Sandy Hartwiger, Misha Sidorsky, Ben Katz, Nick Thompson, Owen Westbrook, Jack Hatchett, Sam Kitrosnell, Jared Inselman, Adrian Banerjee, Tyler Chan, Nick Roberts, Carter Thallon, and Jay Clark, and all absent. And here we have uh, Foster grooving that backhand midfield pull right into the same spot that he did last time. Very effective. Katzenbach picks it up, finds Vince Radoms. There's Sickles on the end zone line, and now he'll try to put it deep to Glazer, Foster coming over, Glazer trying to box him out, and he does. Skies up and grabs it with the right hand. Yeah, Foster was expecting that just to ride out towards the center of the field a little bit better, and Glazer boxed him out on the inside. Pan has got it from Katzenbach. Swings it around to Brandolph. Sickles was not available on his first option. They go to the second one, he lays out, and he's got it for the goal. What a layout there by Billy Sickles. Oh my, as he was running down the field, and I saw where that disc was put up, I just wasn't sure how he was gonna figure out to get his hand near the disc, let alone catch it. Uh, he did sort of a little contortion in midair and jammed his hand straight out into the disc. Here we see the box out by Glazer, but you can see Foster chose to get onto that side. He thought it was gonna ride farther. And this is that layout. You're going to see him just sort of, I don't know, just stick his arm out there. Ah. He got it. It's a fantastic yeah. catch. About three inches off the ground, Billy Sickles. It looked like Brandolph wanted to go to him initially, and then he started to clear out off the side, headed for the end zone. Yeah. He started, here's another angle at it. He turned his body to the side, maybe to give himself some extra reach. Yeah, well, that's exactly what it is. And it's one of those things that he's been playing ultimate for so long, started playing in high school, that when you play when you're a kid, you see so many bad throws that as you get older, <laughs> you don't have to work on those skills. You already have them. So he's been throwing stuff like that before. You can see he's a little uh, gassed here on the sideline having to make that catch. But that's one of the reasons he gets thrown to so frequently is because he will make those catches, th those sort of mid-level passes into goals and completions. Well, now both teams have thrown a midfield pull out of bounds as Leon Chow does it this time, and Boston will take it at the brick mark. Well, it's one of those things where you could say that they're trying to conserve energy tr by getting down on the pull, but that makes more sense if you're running the whole field rather than if you're starting at midfield. On a warm night like this, 
3.07 left to go in the first half. Frosted in the horizontal. This one will hang, float. Taylor using his size, goes up and grabs it. Now Taylor sends one deep, looking for Tanner Johnson again. Chow coming on, Johnson trying to box him out, and Chow gets over three feet shorter than Johnson and takes it away. Yeah, that's a one-on-one -on -one matchup that Boston was thrown to. They're just trusting Johnson to come down with it. Chow had totally other ideas in his head. Chow's got it back now. Swings it to Casey. Casey with a backhand for Esser into the end zone, and Esser's got this one easy as Philadelphia gets their first break of the night. Good work from end to end there from Philadelphia. After we saw Chow get the block, Philadelphia was off to the races and didn't look back. Ties it up at seven. Esser and Casey with the celebration. Yeah, Chow took that inside route. Johnson was trying to put a roof on over him, but Chow's length as, he's only about six feet tall, but he has very long arms, and has his timing is very, ex, his timing is extremely solid. And he'll, if you give him the opportunity to get his hand up first, he's going to. And that ties us back up at sevens with that first break. That's very key for Philadelphia as we're getting later in this first quarter, as the, I mean, later in the first half, as the half comes to a close, we're at sevens. So this should give us about three more points of play, maybe two more, maybe four more if, they, if we get a couple quick ones. But we're running out of time here, and one of these teams should be able to gain an advantage going into half. Esther gets his 10th goal of the season. Had an assist earlier in this one as Hooker brings in that pull. Cooper gets it right back to him. Boston in a hybrid line here with Hooker yep. out there on offense now. Well, early it's just him. Foster on the near side, sends it over to Taylor. He finds Hulkyard. This one hangs up. Foster lays out on the second attempt and he's got it. Should have been an easy completion, but the pass hopped up into the air and Foster had to make an excellent play to get there. Sends another hammer to the end zone, again looking for Johnson. Two players over and Tanner Hulkyard comes over. One Tanner or the other. <laughs> yeah, as I was watching Foster sort of survey the field, I got that sense that he was like, okay, so the offense isn't working exactly how it's supposed to. I'm going back to the hammer. I'm gonna put it up to this side and we're gonna see who comes down with it. Uh, his teammates obviously know that he has the intention to put those passes up to the break side, and Hulkyard comes in and just owns the space. This is Foster's layout on the second attempt, and O'Connor had to jump over him after. And then you see, well, Johnson, I think, might have had that too initially, yeah. and then brings his arms down as Hulkyard's got it. Hulkyard took that inside route. He, he was the guy who threw that pass that Foster had to make up uh, for the error on and then he made up for the error on Foster's throw. It was imperfect, but it's just a goal. He's got two tonight, 11 goals on the year. This has been an impressive rookie for the Whitecaps. And there's 148, so that was a lengthy point. I don't know if we'll get to the four that you were talking about, well, potentially. It's, it's on the high end, it could happen Still here. possible. But uh, the key is going to be this is how the timing goal. works out. Hangs up there, Bear brings it down. Brandolph's got it in the center. Boston came out in a very structured defense there, working some switches on the pull play. Dumps it back to Bear. There's Panna, this time he stays on his feet. And then pushes off Whitehead. I'm calling Interesting. disc space on him though. I mean, he was too close, but I'm not sure Panna's allowed to push the player off like that either. Panna keeps it going right away. Sickles has it. Hooker stays out there for back-to-back -back points. Coming over on to Sickles. Brandolph around. They're looking for Panna again. Panna just short of the end zone. On the line, actually. Has to drop it back for Sickles. They've got Glazer, and Glazer creates some separation away from Hirschberger. Matt Glazer on the board for the first time tonight. It's a very standard cut for Glazer in a way because he's just coming to that front cone and the player who's covering him simply doesn't have the speed to keep up with him. Eight to eight now. Philadelphia holds on for that one. It looked like uh, Boston may have switched the mark there. It looks like Hooker may have decided to force back toward this sideline and the Glazer made that cut from further across the field so his defender may not have had an opportunity to switch to the other side. 
Glazer with 22 goals now on the season. He's second in the league, only behind Timmy Purston, who has 24. <laughs> and who managed to get up to 100 career-wise. So True. And trailing a little <laughs> bit behind a goal scorer like that is no, there's no shame in that for Glazer. Not at all. Almost all of the top five in goals are from the Western Conference with the exception of Glazer and Del Rico Johnson. Brad Hauser of Seattle and Peter Woodside also up there. I think it speaks to one of the ways that it's a little bit different on the West Coast where they force it to certain high-level players, whereas the top teams on the East, which would be Philadelphia and Boston, seem to be more democratic in their approach. There's Tanner Johnson. This one gets into Herskew. As Herskew and Martin were getting tangled up, and then they call Herskew for a travel. It's an interesting travel call. I mean, I'm... I like to advocate for the travels being called tighter and having them be turnovers. In this scenario, he had a player running into his back, so he got penalized for having a defender on him, essentially. First you gets it around. Edmonds, similar fashion, but no call that time. First again, finds Johnson. McNaughton thinking about taking off. That was almost a collision between two Boston players as Foster collects it. Foster. This big OI backhand, he's got Taylor in the end zone. Taylor going over, and it's away from him. I think there was a hand on it by Lindsay. And knocks it out the back. Yeah, it's just a little bit of an inaccurate throw. That's the first one that uh, Foster's had at a high stall count where it didn't end up being a completion. He might have actually been better served by throwing a hammer there instead of a backhand. We'll see what Philadelphia can do with 13 seconds left to go in the half. They could take their first lead of the game as Bryant will start it off. And Boston is all, all the way deep. They have a couple players Johnson back and deep of, 50, of the 50-yard line, whereas Philadelphia's players are still all underneath them. Martin they need to start getting to the end zone. Drops it back for Bryan again. Far side, Peck. Peck needs to put it up. Sends it towards the end zone. It'll carry the distance. And it's deed up by Boston as Martin and Esser were there. I think Johnson got a hand on it, though. Knocks it away. And that's the way the half comes to a close, all tied up at eight. Very ultimate-like to <laughs> send the half at eight points. So we'll take it a break here. It's halftime, eight to eight, the Spinners and the Whitecaps. Welcome back to Cary Stadium, halftime, eight to eight, the score, the Whitecaps and the Spinners going toe to toe, and we've got one of the men from the Spinners downfield side, Billy Sickles, had a pretty impressive first half. It's hot out there, isn't it, Billy? Yeah, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> I, uh, I just had an ice pack on my, on my neck and keeping cold towels uh, rotating around with, with all the guys, so uh, we're just trying to stay hydrated and you know just uh, try to use our full bench. Tell us a little bit about that uh, layout catch that you made on, I believe it was a throw from Brandolf. Yeah, um, well, you know, with Brandolf, I, I always feel like I'm open, even if I, I'm covered, because I have a lot of trust in uh, his, his field vision. So um, I kind of came out to the outside and then 
just kind of turned the page and was looking for the disc, and it uh, you know, hung up long enough where I could make a play on it. Yeah, we weren't really sure you were going to catch up to it. We were trying to figure out which hand you were going to go with and how you were going to chase it down, and then you ended up laying on the turf there for a little bit. Yeah. Maybe that's what you need to cool down from. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I actually did like a nice little lefty scoop, um, which I actually hurt myself on uh, a couple games ago. But uh, again, you know, with, with Brandoff, I, I always feel like I'm open, and you know, it was a good good throw by him to, to let it sit as long as it did. And I think uh, that the tough part for you is that, that Sean Doherty's been matching up on you pretty well, and we've been seeing a lot of back and forth between the two of you. How's that been? Uh, you know, he's a really good defender. We, uh, we have a really good uh, physical matchup. Um, he's, we're kind of bodying each other, so we have a lot of respect uh, for each other's games, and, you know, he got me earlier on the hook. I got him uh, back on the on the cone there, so you know he's just a, a very very challenging matchup for me. But you know there's a lot of mutual respect there. Yeah, it looks that way from up here. It's been a blast watching the two of you play. Uh, what should we expect to see in the second half from the Philadelphia offense? It looks like you guys are a little bit out of time. Yeah, I mean uh, we just they're they're throwing a, a few different looks that we haven't seen a lot of, even though we've been practicing. So um, I think you started to see uh, in the second quarter we started to get into a bit of a rhythm. Uh, defense has been getting a lot of turns, and we just, you know, got to punch in those breaks, and I think we'll be all right. All right. Uh, thanks for your time. Try to get into the shade a little bit so you can get out here and give us a great second half, huh? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Good stuff from Billy. We'll step away here at halftime. It's 8-8. Eight to eight. Welcome back to Cary Stadium at halftime. It's 8-8. Eight to eight. Jeff Poster, Dusty Rhodes, and a pretty back-and-forth first half, Dusty, as we revisit our keys to the game. I think people probably surprised that Boston had mostly a lead for that first half with their shortage of bodies. Yeah, it's, it's actually their first lead against Philadelphia during the That's regulation play during the entire course of the season so far. And while Boston has had some struggles with their offense, Having those defensive players out there makes it more difficult for Philadelphia to get their breaks. So Boston looks like they're starting to, starting to figure out how their offense will look with these different players out there. But the key for them is just to figure out in this second half how they're going to attack Philadelphia differently. On the other side, Philadelphia, while they've been behind, they've been hanging in there. It's, I don't think it's been more than a two-goal deficit this entire way. And this is the one game that they've had this season that it hasn't looked like they're in control from the start. In the two matchups against, against Boston so far this season, they were in control of those games, even though they dropped one of them. Against every other opponent, they've had multiple breaks uh, that have come together and sort of taken that opponent out of the game. In this game so far, they've only gotten one break. And we talked about this before the game with the maladjusted halftime, is that in the second half, 
the White Caps have outscored the, the spinners 19 to 13. And generally, the spinners' margins in the second half are much lower against every team, not just against the White Caps. So the White Caps couldn't have chosen a better place to go into halftime. And the spinners have to be a little bit concerned right now. They've got to collect themselves and figure out what they're going to do to deal with this depleted Boston roster that is showing so much fight right now and so much conviction that they can win this game that the spinners are the ones uh, who are caught off balance. Well, the heat, I think, is definitely playing a factor. Guys, are, we've seen them putting their ice on their necks and the wet towels, but we've still seen plenty of highlights here in that first half. Christian Foster's been one of the guys that we've seen a lot of, and he's had three big hammers, this being one of them, to McNaughton. Here's we another it. one. It's, it's just the same, same throw. Thing. You just same put spot. it off to that far side. Different I player. I think the Philadelphia is starting to be a little more aware that Foster's looking for that in high stall counts. So in this play, we've actually got multiple players making the uh, attempt on a block there, multiple players in on offense making the catch. So Christian Foster trying to keep the Boston Whitecaps afloat. We'll see what they can do when the second half gets started. Coming up. Team in there, you just have as much fun as possible. It's an experience, man. You turn around and you look, and there's this big giant animal running towards you. When I first started commentating, it was kind of tough for me because it's like, well, I can be out there too. I can play with these guys. Well, why am I up here in the booth? Jeff Grant is, is he's a freaking monster. Um, he can sort of just do it all, you know? A few of my students were like, We saw you on the bus. I was like, I don't ride the bus. No, you're on the side of the bus. Welcome back to Cary Stadium, where we're all tied up at eight here at halftime. Jeff Poster, Dusty Rhodes, and like I started to say before we went to break the last time, Dusty, I think the heat and the, the wind occasionally, that cross breeze, are definitely playing a factor, but it's still been a highlight-filled first half. Both teams going head-to-head -head here as we take a look at some more of the first half highlights. This is a nice had a pretty good yeah. game. This is a nice toss out in front to start the game to out to Radoms, who, as we look at the game it seems that he's taking the spot of Himalaya Meta yeah, and definitely. giving them a deep option but he just doesn't have the same foot speed as Meta. Well he'll have to find it they say that Meta does come back it wouldn't be until at least the championship and how about Tanner Johnson for the Whitecaps on the other side hasn't this is his first interaction with the team this season and he's been a huge factor already. And most of it's been positive there are a couple plays that he kind of left on the field they didn't quite make them but for the most part He's been a positive addition to their offense and has, been on cue. and has been taking on a, uh, a big role for them. Victor Luaga getting a D right here. And here's Billy Sickles, who we talked to, boxing out as Philadelphia's done a beautiful job boxing out the Whitecaps on several occasions. Repeatedly, and that throw uh, almost shouldn't have gotten there. And here we see the big look from Sickles, and Glazer again is boxing out. out Foster, who just tried to read it off to the other side. And here's that fantastic catch again by Sickles. Uh, that's not a catch that every player in the league can make. That's a, that's a catch that you can only rely on from your top receivers. Second half action should be coming up when we come back. The team in there, you just have as much fun as possible. It's an experience, man. You turn around and you look, and there's this big giant animal running towards you. When I first started commentating, it was kind of tough for me because it's like, well, I can be out there too. I can play with these guys. Well, why am I up here in the booth? Jeff Grant is, is he's a 
freaking monster. Um, we can sort of just do it all, you know? A few of my students were like, we saw you on the bus. I was like, I don't ride the bus. No, you're on the side of the bus. Back here at Cary Stadium as halftime finishing up. Jeff Poster, Dusty Rhodes, 8-8, eight to eight, and home field advantage on the line, Dusty, for the playoffs. And I said at the beginning of the game, in the three years prior, the Eastern Conference team that was the visitor in the playoffs has never managed to go on to the championship. So we know what a huge factor it is. And right now, as we take a look at Tanner Johnson, the Whitecaps, who's been phenomenal, we still don't know who will have that home field advantage. Yeah. Let's take a look more at Johnson. Nice little inside out there, but the mark was overcommitted to the far side. And we're seeing these foster throws again, but it always seems to be Johnson who's near those break side looks. The other one that Hawkeyard ended up catching, Johnson was he the was other right there, option yeah. right there. The one mistake he might have had was that he thought he just had the height and reach <laughs> over Leon Chow, and the veteran Chow showed him, I don't care how tall you are, <laughs> I'm getting this disc. Uh, Chow's been player. getting blocks on all sorts of different players the whole time he's been playing. He specializes in sort of uh, reading cross-field passes and jumping into those lanes, but he's also versatile enough that he can certainly go up and uh, contend with the biggest players in the air. We're going to take one more break here, and when we come back, second half action set to begin. Welcome back to Cary Stadium as we get set to start the second half. We'll get in at the White Cap Huddle. Have led for the majority of this game. But Philadelphia right on their heels, tied it up just before halftime. Nearly took a lead there in the final seconds, but Boston got the D from Tanner Johnson, the guy we had just been talking about. And this is the uh, this is the moment where both teams are sort of saying to each other or saying to themselves, well. We had that first half, we ended up tied 8-8. Let's just run it back and play a second half. We'll see who comes out the victor. Now it's a 20-minute uh, game instead of a 40-minute game. The first half is essentially inconsequential. So Boston will receive the poll to start this third quarter as their O-line heads out there. Makeshift O-line tonight. <laughs> well, as you can see there, they do have a lot of size on their O-line, but this is a big team generally. Uh, and the smaller players out there have enough skill and enough speed, depending on which player specifically we're speaking of, that they're no easy matchups either. Well, you got to think, too, maybe going forward when they get their bodies back, a guy like Tanner Johnson, he might have played his way onto the O-line in a permanent state. <laughs> but that's a story for another day. Yeah, it, it's always tough to tell when players step up and do well in the absence of the rest of the roster, how the coaches and how the rest of the team are going to deal with that going forward but it speaks to the depth of the team overall, that you have the ability to reach down into the players who have not been playing that big a role and rely on them in, this in, uh, in a, as important a game as this. So again, the ever essential and important home field advantage in the Eastern Conference Finals is on the line. We already know that these two teams will match up again in week 12 of the season. That would be the postseason. And the winner will move on to the MLU Championship to take on the winner of the Western Conference Finals in July. So Boston gets the disc to start here. Cooper reeled in the pole, gets it up to Taylor, and right away, Philadelphia comes out aggressive with McCutcheon getting the D, and they can get a quick score. 
Chow, he throws it in, and it's Esser. Had a very nice night so far. And he's, he's doing Himalaya Meta's cheer with the arrow. Right <laughs> Someone has to, I guess, with you, Meta out. You've got to give him the shout out, even though he's here in attendance on the sideline and giving what he can. But uh, this first break here, this is McCutcheon on McNaughton, which is just speed on speed. Yep. They were a he was able to read the play well enough that he anticipated that, got a, a running start. And then as uh, he got the block, Philadelphia, as they usually do, went to attack right away. It's a one throw goal with 27 se or 17 seconds off the clock. Well, that's Philadelphia's first lead of the night. We had just said they were almost able to take the lead in the final, I believe it was 13 seconds they had left with the disc at the end of the first half. And they score in just over 15 seconds to start the second half. And that's putting to rest the notion that they're gonna get totally outscored or blown away in the second half here. We'll see what Boston does next. They've obviously got the same line out there. Nothing really happened. Yeah, how do they respond? Taylor, double team. This one hangs up, but Edmonds beats out Shields to it. That one very close. Chow gambling for the catch D against Taylor. And that's what we were talking about just a moment ago. That's the sort of block that Chow gets very frequently where he reads the cross field pass in the handler space and accelerates through to get the block. Edmonds finds McNaughton. McNaughton right on cue to Tanner Johnson. Nine to nine. Boston got right back onto it with a reasonably quick score of their own. It's a little bit longer, but very confident possession there from uh, Boston, even though Philadelphia had an opportunity at a block. Thomas Edmonds gets to McNaughton in stride. One, two, three. Those players go into the end zone. 9.16 left to go, tied up at nine. So both teams trying to strike quickly here yeah. in the second half. It's an interesting start there. Uh, it sort of shifts the tenor of the game, shifts the tone of what's going to be happening here in the second half as Boston is now uh, the, the team that is one step behind, so to speak. After, after As they've given up a break, both teams now have two breaks on the game. See Philadelphia's line out there, Nick Heronet, captain, directing traffic, so to speak. Got to give the players their assignments, make sure we know what the pull play that's going to be happening is. And he'll hang back, but this is a short pull. And Brandolph will get it on the far side. Sends a flick up to Panna. Panna's been very involved tonight. And there they broke down the structure of uh, Boston's little poach that they like to run off of the pull play and sprung Panna open with no defender within 20 to 25 yards. Sickles finds Glazer. Glazer looking for Radoms and Radoms. Even for him, on a floating disc, had to really extend up a short jump and come down with it with a left hand. It seemed like there for a moment, I wasn't sure if it was gonna float over him, and then I recognized which player it was waiting <laughs> in the end zone to just stick his hands up and make an easy catch. Even, he looked like he was going to, he thought he had to jump, and then he started to, and I was like, oh, this is there. I'll just stick my I'll big just, arm I'll up there and grab it. it. <laughs> it's nice to have receivers like that that you can rely on. Makes it 10 to nine, Philadelphia, with 8.58 left to go. Again, both teams just moving quick here to start the third quarter. Could amount for a lot of points played. And we've seen that in the past from these two teams. Sometimes in the third quarter, they just go on this run where they trade offensive points over and over and over again. The defenses aren't quite prepared for the adjustments that the offense has made during halftime. Yeah, you know, upwards almost to 20 points played in one quarter between these two. It was up in Boston, I believe. Yeah. yeah. That was a wild 17 run. 17 or 18 points played in a quarter, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Some games only eclipse that many. <laughs> <laughs> and usually you're very pleased if you get anywhere near seven or eight points in a quarter for your team. Johnson gets it up to Edmonds. Edmonds marked by Patel, trying to trap him on the sideline, sends a scuba over to Herskew. Nice job to swing it to McNaughton. The middle of the field, Taylor. Taylor gains some space. Sends a blady flick to Johnson. Johnson looking at the end zone. It's cut off from Cooper. Herskew wanting the disc, saying I'm poached, I'm open, get it to me. From Edmonds, Herskew gets it back to Edmonds. Little contact, and then Edmonds throws it in again to Tanner Johnson. <laughs> he just seems to be everywhere when Boston needs him. He's making a lot of these are easy goal catches and easy throws. While he's come down with some difficult ones, 
maybe it's a, a matter of he's playing the first game for Boston, which means Philadelphia wasn't not sure what he was going to be doing, didn't know who they were going to match up on him. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, he's got very long strides, which means he can pull away from either taller players or shorter players. If he gets the, if he gets the first step, he tends to maintain that advantage or even increase it. He's got three goals and an assist on the night. Nearly had four, but Hulkyard took it away from <laughs> him. <laughs> you got to argue with that amongst your teammates there because you, <laughs> you don't get credit for half a goal there. You got to take it for one or the other. That knots it back up at 10, 8, 11 to go. Back and forth we go. Philadelphia still with the break ahead of Boston. And Hirschberger ready to pull. Little carry a bit. And right into Brandall's hands. He finds Glazer. Yeah, Philadelphia's been running that sort of set it up in a side stack, make a big wide open space on the far side of the field, but actually run it right back towards that side stack to uh, eliminate Boston's poaching defense to start. Sickles backhand around to Panna. Baker slipped, might have had a play on it. This one up to here and it. Sickles making his move. He's got Jordan Taylor trailing him. And now he's looking his direction here and it. And Sickles with another layout grab for the score. Sickles is really working hard out there tonight. Yeah, and he was talking about the heat, so it means he's kind of aware of that. Doesn't really want to go down to the ground over and over again where it's a little bit warmer down yep. there. But you see here, he's willing to do it for his team. And that's how you earn the trust of your teammates. We mentioned that when he made that first catch. We mentioned it again when he makes this catch because you need to do it over and over and over again. Both Hiranet and Brandolph are reliable, confident throwers, but sometimes the throw gets a little too far away, leads him in the wrong direction, and that's where the receiver has to make up the difference. Billy retakes the lead, 11 to 10, 741 left to go. Just keeping the pressure on Boston's offense. Again, very short-handed tonight on a short pull. A slide on the turf for a couple of extra yards, but he's 20 yards ahead of the end zone. That one really threaded through up to Cooper. He led him big time, Taylor did. Philadelphia came out in sort of a zone look to start there, got an opportunity for possibly a block, and now they're just in demand defense now. McNaughton got knocked down by McCutcheon, still comes up with the catch. Edmonds, Foster back out on the field. Foster working around, far side to Cooper. Philadelphia was hunting for oh that man. block. All alone, Tanner Hulkyard. It looked like Chow was gonna get an opportunity uh, but the thrower was able to pull that disc back. And then after that moment, it was easy sailing for the Boston offense. Here's the chance where Chow was looking for the block out on the swing pass. The thrower was confident enough and calm, got it to Cooper, and then it was an easy throw back across the field. Alcard having a nice night himself with three goals. Boston looking to their tanners. <laughs> well, really they're big bodies in the end zone. You can do well worse than throwing it near <laughs> them, as we've seen here today. Uh, they're confident going up and getting the disc from one of the top shelves. They're also confident enough to body folks out and create space to make easy catches. Hulkyard now has 12 goals on the year, which actually ties him for the lead on the team with Carter Thallon, as Boston really spreads it around. And you don't see anyone with a huge number of assists for their team either. I think coming in, it was uh, Foster with Boston 11 assists. 11. Couple more tonight. Nice crit by Panna. I'm not sure he was in bounds there. Kind of sure. rolled after. Yeah. I'm not sure which part of his body hit first. James Kulinski get a look talking at about it here. it here. There's a hand block by Davis Whitehead, or he got a hand on it. He was in. And then, yeah. Panna gets his left hand down on the ground. Exactly, and we saw a play like that last year in the back corner of the end zone where a player got his hand down to make sure a goal happened right before he flew out the back. And the same thing there from Glazer. He was definitely in. First point of contact was his offhand. Floats that one up to Panna. Has to stretch out with both his hands on the jump. Panna trying to get around Stevens. Dumps it back. It's going to be close, and Bear lays out and makes the grab. A lot of second efforts here from Philadelphia tonight on the layouts. I was expecting that to be down. I'm surprised that he made the catch. Bear got right back up, 
Gets the catch from Damiano and then finds Radoms in the end zone. It's good confidence from there after a possible example of one of the worst turnovers in Frisbee where you throw the disc backwards towards the other team's end zone, give them a free fast break. Boston was already off to the races, so they were behind here after the near turnover. And it really floated it out in front of Bear. You see the effort as he's kind of almost stumbling to it. Ooh. That is very close. I'm not sure that was up. That was so close. The ref was much closer to the play than us, so I had a better view on it, but we do have the advantage of getting a little bit of replay, and that looks like it bounced off the turf first. Well, I applaud Bear's effort to get right back up and involved in the play. Damiano hits him with a quick upline strike, and then he points right at Radoms and says, you're my guy. <laughs> Catch this one. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice, to, it's nice to have that on your team where you, uh, your throwers trust your receivers, your receivers trust their throwers, and that's where you get the confidence to score repeatedly. And this half has just, I mean, this quarter has just seen uh, seven goals already. And Taylor will think big here as he sends a huck to Herskew. Herskew's got a couple of guys trailing on him, but he reads it all the way into the end zone, so add him on. And goals just keep piling up here. It's just a 10-second goal there. And that was totally blown coverage in Philadelphia. The two deep players lost track of him uh, as he ran deep. Herskew had enough speed and read this disc well enough. Colton was catching up to him, but it was irrelevant because the disc was already in Herskew's hands. And Herskew's not normally a guy that Boston sends deep <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, but gets it anyway. We see that from Philadelphia too. Is sometimes they'll look deep to players like Hearnet, they'll look deep to players like Brandolph. It all depends on if you get yourself open enough at the right time. Any player on the team can hit you. DJ DeBaz is going to pull for Boston. A guy we haven't called his name too much. The team nicknamed him T-Pop, actually, after the first game of the season because he had one throw <laughs> in the entire game and was perfect <laughs> at the top <laughs> of the leaderboards there for a little bit. It's interesting to see the way statistics play out with rates and things like that, where you have small sample sizes yeah. and you have players <laughs> jump up to the leaderboards and then adjust over the rest of the season. Pull on the ground. Brandolph picked it up, got it to Glazer. Panna. Panna dealing with Stevens and a call downfield against Boston. So 10 yards here for Panna. Across midfield. Glazer doing a lot of work already before the disc is in play. Yeah, it was a little unclear as to where they were going to be starting. And now Panna looking towards the end zone for Sickles. Sickles has got a beat on Richardson, and he's got another goal. Yeah, it didn't look like he had to work quite as hard without having Doherty right in his hip pocket. And there the throw from Panna was perfectly timed as Sickles sort of came out into the lane and went out towards the far sideline and then went deep. As he went deep, Richardson turned his back on the thrower and that's exactly the moment that Panna put the disc up with an inside out backhand. And he put it right up over the defender's head. So the defender never really had an opportunity to find the disc and make a play. While Sickles had a perfect view on it, was running at pace and could make a nice easy leap over the top. 13 to 12, Philadelphia back on top. That was already the ninth point played in this quarter with 5.43 still left to go. That would have, uh, yeah, that's a pretty high number at this point because that would have uh, taken us to about midway through the second quarter in that first half in order to get nine points between these two teams. Cooper reels in the pull and again, right up to Taylor. Finds Johnson. Johnson, this one, Blady, it's tipped. And then Herskew comes down with it. Martin had it. Couldn't keep it away from Herskew all the way though. And then Cooper looking at the end zone, McNaughton is there. It's another situation where you've got to approach that if you're Martin as if you're in the end zone. If he was in the end zone, he would have tried to reach his hand out and catch the disc instead of reaching his hand out and trying to hit the disc on a defensive play. And he's got to be hearing that from his teammates on the sideline, even though they know that he knows, he's just got to stick his hand out and catch it or knock it down instead of swiping with the momentum and the spin of the disc to tap it back up into the air. That was the first opportunity that Phillies had since that first break that they got in this quarter, and it wasn't a good enough play on Martin's half, Martin's behalf. That's just the way the first quarter started, or the first point of this third quarter started. Philadelphia got that break, and Chow threw it into the end zone. Since then, both 
offenses have held on each point. It took us 14 minutes and 35 seconds to get 10 goals between these two teams to start the game. And here it's only taken five, uh, four minutes and change to get 10 goals in this quarter. Sickle sends it up to Bear. Radom's able to beat Baker under. Trying to get around. Former box leader. Panna sends a huck towards Radom's again. Baker is there. And Radom's looking for the greatest. I don't think Glazer was ready for it. Radom's uh, doesn't look like he's practiced a bunch of greatest, which is actually something you should recommend that players do. He sort of rushed that play. Victor Lua sends one deep for Baker. On the other end, we'll see if Radom's can catch up to him with the height advantage. And Baker goes up with the right hand and tumbles all the way to the ground for the score. And Radom's may gets the first break. Radom's may have the height advantage, but he does not have the speed or explosive advantage when he's going up against Baker. Baker was the is the single season blocks leader, and it's this sort of play where he, when he gets down near the disc, he accelerates through and doesn't allow Radom's to catch up to him. Gets the disc first, despite the outstretched and very long arms of Radom closing down. He'll get a good breather after that one. It looks like Boston has used their first time out here in the second half to set up the midfield pull. And we'll step away very quickly here as Boston sets up for that midfield pull. That was an incredible game to watch. It was a huge loss. I just decided to launch and try to get it. I knew if I went up early enough, I could get it. And all of a sudden, there are feet kind of above heads. Does it all come back to this loss? Does it all come back to this play? If I had four hands, I would put all four hands on up the other line. They had to deliver. Boston kept doing this thing that you didn't think was possible. Welcome back to Cary Stadium. Home field advantage in the playoffs on the line. You just saw a promo for our Game Changers show. Perhaps we'll see a play in this one that is a game changer that leads to that home field advantage. Right on the verge of that here, we're in the third quarter and anything could happen as we've seen over the last couple plays. Good midfield pull from Boston, pins them back. That one was close as Boston's DeBaz was coming in. They get it out, looking downfield for Peck and Richardson skies up, takes it away. Sickles wasn't able to put enough on that to get it out away from the defender and it looks like Richardson still has a speed advantage on Peck and is taking off downfield looking to get this goal. Stevens finds Hooker. Richardson is open. They go up to DeBaz. Richardson and DeBaz, both former UMass players as well. McMurphy. A tight vertical stack here for uh, Boston. They need to get into their end zone offense and, con and confirm this break. Richardson with the disc, trying to get around, sends it over to Hooker. Boston a little out of sorts here with this break opportunity. Doherty over to Richardson. Ryan Richardson. Rich and then he was looking to put it in to Nick Murphy and Peck poaching off. And Esther's taking off all the way downfield immediately. Or this is Dave Bear. This is the moment where Philadelphia is going to try to attack again. Here we go. The big huck for Esser. It'll be short of the end zone. And Bear quickly headed downfield. Murphy telling Richardson to drop back. And now they float this to the end zone. And Esser, he gets to finish what he started. And Philadelphia able to hold on that time. We barely hold on for that hold. Uh, Boston got all the way up to the doorstep, all the way up on that cone. And then their offense just sort of stagnated. Richardson stayed dialed in on looking upfield, never went to his resets, never engaged the offensive structure. Here we see the D from uh, Richardson downfield. Now we'll see Ryan Richardson essentially throw it directly to Dave Bear. And now Dave Bear knows that if he lays the disc out for Esser, gives him the opportunity to make the play first, he will. And that's exactly what he did to get that goal. Came back across the face of the defender, laid out his body in the defender's, in the defender's path before the defensive player had an opportunity to make a play. That's excellent uh, downfield awareness after the disc is live, or live up in the air is what I mean there. Uh, by Esser. 3.07 left to go. That might have been the longest point thus far of this third quarter. Ties it back up at 14. Boston will up a break now. In fact, that was the only point that was more than a minute long <laughs> so far in this quarter. 
Cooper reels in the pull and sends it up to Taylor, as has been almost every point tonight for Boston. Cooper gets it again. Now Cooper with a long flick downfield, looking for Thomas Edmonds, and Edmonds skies over Patel, short of the end zone, waiting for his offense, drops it back for Foster, and then he gets in to the end zone for the score. That's more like what we've been seeing for this whole quarter. That was just a very quick score, uh, 20 seconds. And then they're putting Philadelphia right back out on offense again after that long point. However, it'll be a different lineup for Philadelphia as their actual O-line goes out. The last one was mostly a D-line. Oh, Patrick Lindsay slipped and allowed the dump to happen. And then Edmonds got a jump on Patel again <laughs> into the end zone. So 15-14, 247 left to go. Well, Boston was missing a lot of players the last time these two teams matched up in Boston. Uh, tonight missing more and mostly from their offensive side. In Philadelphia, while we talked about it early, uh, Boston's offense looked out of sorts, but Philadelphia didn't take advantage of that till nearly the end of the first half. If they had gotten a break or so early on when Boston was uh, disoriented or disjointed a little bit, they'd be in much better position right now. Lua with the pull. Heronet picks it up, starts it off over to Brandolph. Brandolph sends it up to Glazer, drops it right back for Heronet. Glazer has it again, trying to get around Terry Roth. Braz lays out behind Panna, and then I think he got a foot on it because I don't think Panna was initially throwing to Arcata like he was. He's looking for Fortin, who's got it now, and then Fortin immediately throws it away, trying to get Glazer striking into the end zone. This is what we talk about uh, when you want to be quick but don't but rush. Don't rush. So he hurried that throw a bit on the end zone, was throwing it to Glazer before he and Glazer made eye contact. Yes, that could have been a completion if Glazer did exactly what he was expecting, but there was no margin for error, and Glazer was attempting to beat his defender. Well, Boston with an opportunity for a break with 1.55 left to go. Braz has it, trying to get around Panna. Sends it up to Baker. Baker and laying out bid from Dustin Damiano. Knocks it away from Davis Whitehead. I think that was actually a drop from Whitehead. It looked like he got his hands on it first and just wasn't able to complete the pass, but he was under so much pressure that he had the layout underneath. Brandolph makes eye contact, and this time the layout bid is good, and in for the score is Arcata. That was a nice, soft touch throw from Brandolph that put it on the far side of the defender where only Arcata could get to it. You saw the full effort from the defensive player, wasn't able to get far enough. Uh, we got that full layout, two-handed catch here. And here we get a look at the, well, that might have been a block, but it looked like Very it close. got to the offensive player first, and here, he, the throw has removed the defensive player from the equation, even in those tight quarters. He was about a foot away from that disc, and that's not enough to make a play on it. As we saw Arcata give the effort and ability to go out and get that pass. If Randolph didn't know that he was going to actually go out, make the bid, full on layout, and make the catch, that space isn't open for him as a thrower. Arcata was very involved on that point. He had the catch on the far side. Uh -huh from Panna that I believe was initially intended for Fortin and I think Frederick Brass got a foot on it we as he released. Did. I don't, you can't throw a throw with that much <laughs> wobble on it uh, in, in terms of not having it come off of something first. Defensive pressure from Philadelphia. McNaughton was not keyed in on his catch and now the spinners can regain the lead. Looking to the end zone, they put it up and Esser skies over Alex Cooper. And Philadelphia back on top with a 16 to 15 lead. And we've seen two of those just errors on the, on the part of Boston's offense during this quarter. That's led to the two breaks for Philadelphia and they've been quick and easy breaks where a player just picks up the disc and tosses it in the vicinity of Esser. So that's what Chow did on the very first break and that's what we see here on this break. Those little unforced errors are the sorts of things that happen uh, both when you're dealing with heat and also when you're dealing with a situation where your players aren't playing with the same people or aren't necessarily playing the same roles that they're always playing. That pass to McNaughton certainly should have been caught, but it was not on time and on target. It was a more difficult catch than it should have been for about a five-yard toss. 
It's starting to feel like momentum might be shifting a, a bit right now. We'll see how Boston comes out and plays this one. This pull, pretty good one. Yeah, Puts nice. Thomas Edmonds halfway back into the end zone. Nice depth on that pull. Sailed pretty well, but not enough for Philadelphia to get down on the very first pass. Enough that they will have to play defense for a full 80 yards. We're under a minute now. McNaughton lays out, makes a nice grab. Drops it back for Edmonds. Edmonds trying to get around the mark. Puts it up to McNaughton again. Wind picks up on this point. Johnson has it. Cross midfield, 40 seconds. Drops it back for Foster. Foster looking towards the end zone. Edmonds and Johnson there, and Edmonds skies up and grabs it. And then he punts the disc in celebration. Back-to-back -back goals here for Thomas Edmonds. Excellent play coming back to the disc here a little bit and going up over the players who are coming in. Shields, Shields had a good run at that and got up with enough height but Edmonds got up there just a step early as he was coming from the opposite direction. It's impressive to be able to get up uh, sufficiently high when you don't have a chance to run onto the disc the same way the defender does. That's the fourth assist of the night for Christian Foster. Actually, the last two goals for Boston were Foster to Edmonds. This has been quite the high scoring quarter. Boston's got eight goals in this quarter and Philadelphia's got eight as well. Eight to eight is the score. <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly. This, it was that half. So the entire first half is equal here in the third quarter. I'm not exactly sure what it is about these two teams that brings out these high scoring third quarters, but I'm loving watching it. <laughs> it's exciting. Going up and down the field so quickly that uh, it may even just be tiring the offenses out by having to run so freely through everything. Just try to get it down there as quick as can be. This one, they, Brandolph lets drop at his feet, picks it up, finds Glazer, unmarked. Sickles headed deep, Doherty trying to keep him honest. And now he heads under. Down to 20 seconds. Panna drops it back for Glazer. Glazer trying to get around Lua. Stall count getting up there. And a timeout called. So yep. that'll erase it. And we'll have see if the clock changes at all. We have 12 seconds at the moment. But we're going to take a timeout. When we come back, Philadelphia have the disc looking to take the lead into the fourth. Back here at Cary Stadium, Philadelphia using their first time out here in the second half. They put the clock back up to 15 seconds and while we have the break in the action, Matt Esser is a player that we should be talking about right now. He's had quite the game for the spinners on both sides of the disc. He's trusting his receiver here. Uh, Peck comes on and makes the second effort catch, but the way that Esser plays is all about what he does downfield as a receiver himself. He chased that nice Dave Bear throw down and now we're going to get another opportunity to see this play where he lays out across the front of the defender and makes it impossible to stop him. And this is another of those short field goals. The first one that we saw was the beginning of that second half, and then we saw a second one there where it's just a set play, and it's very difficult to deal with Esther one-on-one, -on -one, even when you know the disc is coming to him, and even when you know where the disc is going and when it's going there. He can, he can beat you to that spot, and you're not going to get through him to the other side. Former Rookie of the Year, he's got four goals and an assist tonight. And head coach Daryl Stanley right there in the huddle with Esser. And Philadelphia looking to take the lead. They put the clock back up to 15 seconds at the timeout. Take the lead into the fourth quarter. And it looks like they'll be putting on sort of a jump ball line almost as we're seeing Martin Martin's and Radom's out there, out yeah. there along with Esser. But then you've got Sickles, Panna, Hiranet, and Brandolph out sort of as your normal offensive core. Uh, they're gonna be spreading it out with two resets here to try to pull some more Boston players back behind the disc, give a little more space downfield. But credit again to Daryl Stanley for getting a timeout in there before the stall was called. Boston gets some height out there themselves in Hulkyard, Hirschberger, and Johnson. They drop it over to Esser, actually. I would have expected him to go deep. Esser gets it to Brandolph. Brandolph trying to deal with Hooker, finds Karenet. 
Nick has been familiar with these end of quarter scenarios, puts it towards the end zone, looking for Radoms, Hirschberger, and Radoms comes up with it. Wow. Huge score. That Vince Radoms kills out the third quarter and sends Philadelphia into the fourth with a 17 to 16 lead. And that's what we see Radoms do more than once over the course of this season, is he finds his spot, and then as this throw goes up, it's got enough height on it that it eliminates the shorter players from the field, and then Radoms just goes up in the crowd, and no one else even reached up to the same height as him. So what a way to end the third quarter. Exciting third quarter as that both teams go back and forth, and Vince Radoms, he will send us into the fourth. Innova is proud to support Major League Ultimate and its incredible athletes as the official disc of the MLU. The Innova Pulsar has quickly become the disc of choice at Ultimate's highest level. Visit InnovaDiscs.com to find a dealer near you. Skippy, the official peanut butter of the MLU, made with the funnest peanuts ever. Skippy, yippee! Fourth and final quarter here, set to go. Carey Stadium, take a look inside the Philadelphia Huddle. Daryl Stanley trying to rally the troops. Jeff Poster, Dusty Rhodes here in MLU Live, Week 9. Sam Rosenthal on the other side. Well, it's interesting. It looked like Daryl was trying to rally the troops while Sam's trying to talk specifically about what they need to do strategy-wise. It may just be a difference in temperament, but it may also be me making assumptions about what they were actually saying. So we'll get some Boston highlights throughout the game here. Mostly Christian Foster has had a huge impact on this one. He's connected with Thomas Edmonds a couple of times as Edmonds and Foster have both come over to the offensive side of the disc. Oh, now we're getting a little bit more of the rallying the troops there from Rosenthal. Well, this is the first half of a doubleheader weekend for Boston. They will be in New York tomorrow afternoon to take on the Rumble. And despite what happens today, while this will most likely decide home field advantage, it doesn't officially do it. Correct. Boston will be in a must win no matter what tomorrow against New York. Should they lose today, it'll, they have to keep the pressure on Philadelphia to keep winning. And it'll be interesting to see how everything goes with Boston and New York tomorrow because Boston historically has just absolutely obliterated yeah. New York most of the times that they face up. But coming on the second day of a back-to-back -back with a shorter roster in New York, uh, after the emotional investment that Boston has put into this game in order to stay up for it physically and mentally, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out tomorrow because New York is certainly ready. Yep. They're hunting for another win. Well, New York, too, if they manage, their last two games will both be against Boston. If they manage to get that third win, they'll eclipse their total from the last two seasons. And they're in a, a, a growing program. You almost want to call it a rebuild, even though they have not made the playoffs. But <laughs> they have so many new faces, so many young new faces, that they're kind of trying to restructure and just start fresh. Yeah, it's not so much, it's, uh, it's like trying to figure out what assets you have. And they've learned that bit by bit. And a lot of their players this year, I mean, we talk about the same folks repeatedly where we talk about Sean Mott and Marquez Brownlee and yep. Scott Zoo and Matt Weintraub. But they have more than that down with 
the rest of their roster as well, and it'll be a good test for them tomorrow against a very quali high quality Boston team. That pull from Victor Lua turned in, but took a while to come down, so Boston gets down defensively, and now Bra's trying to box out Panna, and finally able to return the favor, knocks it away. So Philadelphia started with the disc here on offense after getting the last second score to close out the third, and was trying to steal momentum and go up two which represents the biggest lead of the game thus far. Boston held it in the first quarter. This hangs up, gets over to Lua from Hooker. It looked like Philadelphia there was totally committed to just throwing the very first deep shot. The play was designed to go that way, but it didn't look like Hairnet was even reading the field. Whitehead sends a flick out, and Baker reads it nicely. Slides and makes the catch. He's got to wait for the rest of his offense. Dumps it back to Murphy. Murphy trying to get away from Brandolph, stall count getting up, he throws it into a tight spot, and Panna and Braz, they continue to go back and forth tonight. This yeah. one out over the outstretched arms of Baker. Nice toss from Bear. Bear finds the Sickles, who gets it to Heronet. Glazer is in the end zone, he's got a beat on Wolf, a big beat, and Glazer comes down with it for the score, and Philadelphia's got their largest lead of the night, up two. And we saw Hiron Net put up that very first throw downfield to Panna, but then we saw two excellent throws after the block from Panna to get Philadelphia down to the other side. We saw the first one, well here we'll get a look at that huck down to Panna and the D from Braz. Uh, he got the inside position, he saw that the shoulder, and here we'll get a look at the block from Panna on the cross field high stall count throw. Braz almost had it too on the second chance. This throw from here in net, you could see the connection between those two players. Uh, Glazer was sort of in the end zone trying to choose which way he wanted to go. And here in net decided to throw him all the way out to the far side, which you can see both of the players who were involved in that Taking play a yeah, are, a little having, are having a little bit of difficulty breathing. Uh, they both had to run so far, but the throw from Bear to get all the way downfield to start with there after the turnover was also key. So Boston has their work cut out for them now, down two here in the fourth quarter. And they had their opportunity to get a break there on that last yep. point. Tie it back up. It's the second time we've seen them get stuck on the side of the field. Philadelphia here in a zone defense with uh, Martin dropped very deep to prevent Boston's early deep looks. And Boston, while they're working it up here, it doesn't look like they quite cracked the zone offense quickly. Initially it looked like they were going to. Now they've, they're stuck on that far side. As Foster has it, he's looking for Cooper. He's going to send it to him, and Cooper gets up with the right hand for the goal. Cooper is always the most excited when he <laughs> scores a goal. <laughs> well, I mean, could be down 15, but he's still <laughs> excited about it. Without knocking his ability as a cutter, he is known more as a thrower True. and a handler. So as a player of that ilk myself for most of my career, you get really excited when you're on the other end of it. <laughs> And it's not just the uh, actual motions that he's making with the disc and everything. His facial expression was just pure excitement. There he is dancing to poison. <laughs> <laughs> so Boston cuts it down to 1, 18, 17, with 8, 11 left to go in the game. Yeah, and we can see that Glazer is not out for this defensive point. I mean, this offensive point right now. He's still catching his breath on the sideline. And Dylan Wolf, the man who was giving him chase, is still sort of gassed on the sideline as well. That was a rough rundown. That's what Hearnet will do for you, is he'll throw you open, but he's going to make you run for it. <laughs> Cooper's still dancing on the sideline. <laughs> <laughs> so this pull will carry down, float into Hearnet's hands. Terry Roth right up there. Does not come up to Mark Brandolph, though. Yeah, that's one of the advantages you can have. Is you, if you're covering the player who catches the disc, you can charge down knowing that it's not likely going right back to your player. Randolph catches it immediately. Unleashes for Damiano, who has been seldom used on the offense. Gets that one, brings it back. Cats him back, looking for the end zone, and there's Radoms away from Richardson. Yeah, it didn't look like anybody was keeping up with Radoms on his jaunt down the field there. He had been open for a while, and it was just a matter of finding the right space to get into. So makes it 19 to 17. Philadelphia trying to hold on to this two-goal lead. They'd be more than happy to just to trade points with Boston right now. 
And I would expect to see Philadelphia come out and use that sort of zone look more frequently just to make sure that Boston doesn't get any quick, easy hucks off. If they can slow Boston down, even when they're getting uh, easy holds necessarily, uh, they'll be in better position to win this. This is a great rundown by Damiano, out racing Doherty. And then the veteran Katzenbach, who has seen limited action this season, finds Radoms. Uh, he's been very effective moving back behind the disc, using uh, sort of give and go skills, good footwork, good anticipation as to where his other handlers and cutters are going to be. So he's a reliable thrower and moves their offense along. But yes, he is certainly playing a smaller role than he did last year. Only his second assist this season. I believe he's been dealing with some injuries too. Uh, it happens to, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> McNaughton threw that one a bit behind Johnson. Uses his reach though, he's double teamed. Sends a lefty backhand through the double team up to Cooper. Well he had pressured the around player with a righty flick and it opened up the seam in between the two defenders for that little lefty. Edmonds has it back right around midfield. Finds Taylor. Back to Johnson. Johnson kind of air bounces one over to Edmonds, and then Edmonds looks to send it across the field. O'Connor coming in, knocks down Hulkyard, but he holds onto the disc all the way through. Yeah, and there's a little bit much contact there. Now we're getting some extra curricular activity there as Christian Foster is taking offense to the collision by O'Connor, and O'Connor is getting a band. Yeah, it didn't look like he meant to do that, but he lost track of where the disc was and sort of bumped right into the player there. This throw is so cross field and is in the air for so long that it's really difficult to know what to do as a defender. You're trying to find it coming back over your head and you can see that he tried to pull up and not make that contact yeah. there. And he knew that it was his fault. Uh, but as far as Boston's concerned, you kind of have to take exception to that and let him know that it's not appropriate for him to be making that play. It's tough though, he did lose track of the disc on a very strange cross field throw. This is a very much scenario here where these two teams are becoming big time rivals. Last season and this season at the top of the conference. And even going back to the 2014 season, Philadelphia had a chance to go to the playoffs over Boston and then just missed out. Yeah. It's the uh, it's that familiarity, and it's this thing where Philadelphia believed early on in the MLU that they were primed to be one of the best teams yeah. in the league. And early on in the first couple seasons, they just didn't they didn't have the results to match their own belief, and that creates a little bit of frustration. And they've worked toward it, and this whole time they've sort of carried themselves as though they belong doing uh, belong in the top of the league. But Boston has literally been at the top of the league every year, with the exception <laughs> of that excellent DC current season. So Even then, the Whitecaps almost upset the current in the playoffs, but D.C. was too much that year. Yeah, they were. that was a fantastic season from them. Everything came together. So we're having a little discussion here about where Boston will be pulling from because after the flagrant foul, the band, you get a 40-yard penalty, and whether it's in between, if it's in between the points or after a point has been scored, then you get to pull from uh, 20 yards out of your end zone, it looks like. Philadelphia will be pushed to the back of the end zone. I'm sorry, I don't think it's a 40 yard penalty, it's a 20 yard penalty yeah. is what it looks like here. So uh, we'll get to see if they can get it all the way down into the end zone from here. James Kalinske talking with Daryl Stanley, explaining everything to him. Victor Lua still waiting for the signal to pull here. Well, this is the opportunity Boston needs to try and get a break if they can pin Philadelphia all the way back. You gotta get a big deep pull though. And he's had some good ones today so far. This one is gonna hit and roll. I'm not sure I would've gone with the bladey roller there. He had more success with the uh, big floaty backhands than the sort of knifing blading ones. It only went about a yard into the end zone too, so Philadelphia is able to get right out. Panna has it, drops it back to here and at back into the end zone. Over to Glazer. This one floats up to Arcata, Sickles. Kersky almost found the block there even without knowing where the disc was necessarily. He knew that it was a dangerous area. Sorry, that wasn't Hersky, that was uh, Davis Whitehead there who almost got that block. Aaronette again, Philadelphia taking a long time on this point thus far. Panna's got it against Braz and now he'll send it deep. 
for Sickles. Taylor trailing him, and Sickles lays out, but this time off his fingertips. I was just thinking about how it was going to be Sickles coming up with yet another <laughs> impressive layout block, but that one was just too far. As it left Panna's hands, he tends to throw with a lot of uh, power on his throws early on in the, in the flight path, so it gets downfield in a hurry and then sits a little bit. That one just sailed a little bit farther. It was the low trajectory that made it sail so far. Dylan Wolf back out there for Boston, starts things off. This is close and very short for Victor Lua, who I think it looks like he is hurt trying to lay out for that one. Yeah, that is a really tough play there for Boston where you're throwing it back in the wrong direction and then you have a player trying to make the play on it, may have injured himself here. That's Certainly a little shaken up. They can't afford to do is lose bodies as the trainers come out to attend to Victor Lua. Take another look. It's a good mark here by Brandolph to make sure this pass wasn't an easy completion straight across the field, as that's usually the first look for most offenses. Gets his foot up in the area, slows Very down the- uh, throw. And it slows down what Wolf was doing there. Uh, made him s think twice about exactly where he was gonna release the pass. I'm not sure what Brandolph and Wolf were pointing there about, but he's getting attended to here, so we hope he comes out all right. Looked like he might have, well he's favoring his knee, his right leg. We're gonna step away while the trainers attend to Victor. We'll come back here, 5.49 left to go in the fourth. Back here at Cary Stadium, trainers have gotten Victor Lua off the field. And you see him right there being helped off. And he's definitely having his right leg looked at and hopefully he'll be okay. Oh, and Brandolph throws it away to give it back to Boston. Maybe, it, I don't know, on that replay it didn't look like he fouled him, but those two are close enough to each other that, it's e that it, they should be able to tell from there. So that's that spirit of the game mentality though in effect in the sport of ultimate. It's good to see that just that spirit of competition. And the key is that you don't even need any extra rules to mandate that that happens. Right. Randolph took it upon himself to take that turnover and give it back to the opponent. Wolf gets it up to Christian Foster who comes in for Lua. And Wolf gets it back midfield. No mark on him yet. Now Brandolph will tighten up. Rob very open there. S someone seems, here net seems to have lost track of him downfield. Foster's got it again. But Davis Whitehead headed deep. And he's gonna come back under. Braz finds Roth again. Terry with here net kind of shying off him, slowly catching up. This one will hang for Braz. He lays out and he's not gonna get there. And we've seen more of these reset turnovers from both teams in this quarter than we have previously in the game. And Arcata is totally open here. Yep, all alone, short of the end zone. Braz and Taylor were there. He dropped it back for Esser. And then Sickles, I guess he did jump behind and gets into the end zone. And that puts Philadelphia up 20 to 18 with 419 left. And that was easily the longest point of the second half so far. That took about three minutes for the entirety of it. 
and we end up with a pretty easy goal here from Esser as he just pops the disc across the field. Sickles with the good awareness to jump backwards into the end zone. Not entirely sure that he got up off of the ground before he made contact with the disc, but referees called him in, and we've got a two-point lead with four minutes 19 yet to play. Boston is certainly still in this game. If they hold on offense here, it's just a one-point game again. So all they're going to need is one break to get this into a tie, and then they'll either be able to get ahead or send it into overtime. Possibly some extra Frisbee on board. Always the potential. 419 left. Both teams with two timeouts apiece. Philadelphia not electing to pull from midfield after that one. Each team still has two timeouts left. Yep. Cooper reels it in and up to Taylor. Johnson's got it. Her skew. McNaughton was taking off. Hulk yards there. Collects that one. Hulk yard along the sideline to Edmonds. Johnson's headed into the end zone. He's quieted off a little bit. Good work there by Taylor to body out Casey on the reset cut. Didn't give him an opportunity to make a play on the disc. Long around to Herskew, Hulk yard. Hulk yard looking to the end zone for Edmonds, but Johnson's there. <laughs> Carried a little bit too much for Thomas. But Tanner Johnson, I just said, started to get quiet. Comes in with a goal. And while it's not entirely clear which one of those it was to, I think it was to the receiver who ended up catching it, but the space there was so open that it didn't really make a difference. All they had to do was communicate and make sure one of them caught it. So 20 to 19, 346 left. Boston did just what they had to do right there. Score relatively quickly. Yep. And they will keep it for the full field pull. We should start to see Boston attempting to not only play the tight man defense that they've been doing, but they need to start taking a couple more chances here and there. So whether they are trying to get inside of what Philadelphia's offensive structure is or take a couple individual matchups and take some chances on some of those players, um, it'll poach be... Poach off a bit? Yeah, well, not necessarily poach off a bit, but um, try to set up a block. So if you have a guy who's been using the same move or the same set of moves to get open on you over the course of a day, you start to be able to jump that and anticipate it a little bit better. And if you can make a play happen, that's the time to do it. Foster stays out there and pulls. Boston hoping for a turn so he can be out there to handle. Not only that, maybe they're hoping that he's the guy who's gonna make a play. That's possible too. Did it against DC in week one. He's against Radom's right now, definite height advantage. Radom's tracks it down, slides, makes the grab. Taylor trying to keep up with Fortin, now plays off of him to drop back on Radoms. Sickles was looking for Radoms at first, has to swing it back out to Fortin. Fortin into the end zone, now Radoms is there. And that was that uh, offside block that we saw Hooker going for there on the pass through the lane. He dropped off of hearing it, made a play on the disc. Looks like he was a little bit short by a couple inches there, and Philadelphia gets uh, another score here. You see that deep look down to Radoms, and both of those players are having a little bit of difficulty finding it as it's coming in over their heads. But Radoms finds it, uses his length to get out and make a, not a simple catch, but a reasonably easy catch considering how far downfield he was and where the disc was coming from. Radoms having a pretty nice night. That is his fifth goal. Wow, I didn't even notice. Early. I guess we lost track of that one that he had at the end of the uh, uh, the third quarter there as well. Puts him up to 11 on the season, so very much has stepped into the role that Himalaya Meta has occupied for the year and for the most part hasn't missed a beat. So he's got six goals on the season uh, coming into coming this game, in. and he had five goals in this game. That's like comparing the first quarter or the first half of this game to the third quarter. <laughs> Boston looking to keep up here. Cooper gets it back from Taylor. Gets it back to Taylor. Johnson. Johnson, a very wobbly pass, but McNaughton dives out and gets the grab. And he the sends a scuba over, and then it's knocked away by Chow. And Chow's open right now if they take, pick it up and take that advantage, but it's actually to Philadelphia's advantage to stay calm here and not rush. Cooper knocked the disc away unintentionally, puts it back where it should be. Bryant's got it to start off. Up to Colton. 
Colton, the big backhand across the field, looking for O'Connor in the end zone, and McNaughton elevates it, still up in the air, and O'Connor comes down with it. Wow, Tom O'Connor playing it all the way through. That was a very interesting point on McNaughton's part. He saves a turnover uh, and then turns it over right after that and then chases O'Connor down, who's got to be about six or seven inches taller than him. He gets his first block in the end zone, but it pops back up and then he gets skied. So here we see that catch and then this is his throw. That's a turnover on the next one. And we're going to see him get all the way back down into the end zone on this cross field throw from Colton that just hung up too long. Gets, comes in, he gets his timing right, and goes up and hits it, but then O'Connor already ready for the next play. Yeah, McNaughton came down and kind of lost his balance, and he knew it as soon as he hit it. He was like, oh, I knocked that up. Yep. I got to go down and get it again. We talk about it so often. It's the second opportunity plays. We had Peck make a, a second catch here earlier. We had Martin tip the disc up over to Boston. But it looks right now like Philadelphia is going to get out of this game with a win uh, with only two minutes, 25 seconds left to go, and a three-goal lead. Twenty-two nineteen, the score. Boston has to score on this point. And relatively quickly. Johnson's got it. Sends it over to Foster. Hulkyard was headed deep. Now comes under. I'm a little surprised Foster didn't take that deep shot. Cooper's got it back. Sends a hammer across the field. Tanner Johnson. Johnson continues to Herskew. Herskew trying to direct traffic to Foster. Now Foster looks to the end zone for Thomas Edmonds again. Edmonds has got it, and he's in. Edmonds and Foster have got some good chemistry going on tonight. And Cooper did a really good job reversing the field with that nice, calm hammer all the way over, and then... Boston was able to work back across the field to this side, and Foster took a shot that he liked and got a goal to Edmonds. So Thomas Edmonds gets another one tonight, and we'll step away as Boston uses their second time out. Welcome back to Cary Stadium, 22 to 20. Boston gets a quick score and will set up for a midfield pull with 1.51 left to go. Home field of the playoffs, very much on the line. Will it be in Medford or will it be here at Germantown Academy? Now is the time for Boston. Boston with a great midfield pull, almost perfect to that back cone. Aaron will track it down. Hooker trying to get up quick for the mark. Finds Bear to Glazer. Glazer looking to get it out right away. Sickles with another layout grab. Just sending him to the turf over and over again. And then in the rush, contact caused. And I'll give him a free 10 yards as the clock continues to move. Minute and a half. Sickles directing the play as he was walking up there, getting exactly what he wants. Philadelphia scores. You can pretty much call this one. They're not in too much of a rush to do it because time is a factor for Boston. Randolph leads Sickles, goes up and grabs it. Sickles with that left-handed flick instead decides to drop it around for Brandolph. Brandolph through the middle to Sickles. Sickles keeps it going. Cats him back. Finds Brandolph. Down to a minute. Brandolph will lead Sickles and he's got it. No problem. Billy Sickles makes it 23 to 20, 56 seconds left to go. And that just might do it. Yeah, unless they find some way to either score a two pointer, which we don't have rules for, <laughs> or just score we'll these Callahan. goals in 10 seconds, get a Callahan and turn around. It's this scenario where you kind of know the game is over, but you have to play out the rest of the time anyway. Billy Sickles, an impressive night. Along with everybody else on the Philadelphia Spinners, this has been a very back and forth game. Both teams 
showing why they're the top two in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, Boston had that early lead, uh, took that lead into the second quarter. Philadelphia tied it back up, sending it into half, and then they had a one goal advantage out of that high scoring third quarter where we actually had more goals scored than in, in the t than in an entire first half. Well, Boston's got a score here in about 10 seconds. Cooper's got it, holding on to it, send it across to Taylor. Well, but Philadelphia is dropping an extra player back. And Herskew's headed deep, and this is he is not going to catch up to that. Colton can't hit it the first time, but Chow comes over and knocks it away anyway. Yeah, the clock will stop as it gets uh, tipped so far out of bounds there, and they'll come back in on the corner here. The best thing Boston can do is overcommit underneath and force Philadelphia to go over top of them quickly or force a high-risk throw early. Chow's got it right in the front cone of the end zone. Drops it over for O'Connor. Gets that it to was Bryant. That was close. <laughs> over to Chow. Chow gets it almost through the legs of Johnson. Now Philadelphia is well out of the end zone. Up to O'Connor. O'Connor keeps it going. And Philadelphia is, well, now they slow down. It looked like they were just going to put it into the end zone and definitely put it away. And timeout is called. Yeah, I believe. Uh, Snow count was getting high. Both Coach Stanley and Gabe Colton on the field were both calling timeouts there. So they were of the same mind. We'll take it to just 16 seconds left to go when we come back. Back here at Cary Stadium at the timeout. You see Boston's D-line got to find some kind of miracle right now. <laughs> but it looks like Philadelphia is going to improve to 6-1. and one, Or excuse me, 7-1. and one. And Boston will fall to 5-2. and two. So Philadelphia with the, or Boston rather, I always get it mixed up with a game in hand. <laughs> as Boston's on the double header this weekend. And now, as I said before, this becomes an absolute must win just to keep the pressure on Philadelphia yeah. to win out. And it'll be interesting to see how they come out tomorrow against New York, if they come out and sort of take their frustration out on the rumble, or if they come out and try to do too much right away. If they try to go into that game with uh, any sort of overconfidence or overaggression, yep. it can come back to bite them. They just need to go in and play their game and execute their game plan against a team that should likely be overmatched based on the results we've seen this thus far this season. Luckily, if you're the Whitecaps, this is an earlier game tonight, a 4 o'clock start, and tomorrow's start is also a 4 o'clock yeah. start. So you've got plenty of time. You're not going to get in too late, and you'll have plenty of time to get some sleep, get your warm-ups in with the shortage of bodies. Then we'll be doing the same thing. And we will be there <laughs> as well. <laughs> so make sure you tune in tomorrow night and, and check out the rest of the games tonight, especially out on the West Com Western Conference. San Francisco looks to cling to their very small playoff hopes. Bear looks to put it in, and that's going to do it. Billy Sickles has got it. Philadelphia is going to win this one. There's just seven seconds left. But unofficially now, Philadelphia will have sole possession of first place in the Eastern Conference. Well, they did have sole possession going in True. this weekend due to that mismatch games. of games. Yep. But there's nothing that Boston can do right now to regain it over the course of this weekend. They'll have to hope that the rest of the season plays out, both that they win and that Philadelphia finds a way to lose a game against someone other than Boston, which they haven't done all season. That was the one hiccup that they had coming into this game that we talked about beforehand, is that the only team that Philadelphia has not won against was Boston. And that was in an overtime game where Boston had that one lead in the entire game and that was in overtime. Billy Sickles has seven goals tonight. Seven? Seven goals, <laughs> unofficially, of course. I wouldn't say that they were quiet necessarily, <laughs> but I wasn't sure that they were adding up all Actually, that quickly. Actually, Matt Glazer came into tonight leading the team with 21. That's what Sickles has now on the season. As this pull's gonna go out of bounds at the Philadelphia sideline, Sickles almost caught that one. And that's technically not the right decision for them. They need to uh, do a thing where uh, they 
like would have liked to r put a roller onto the field so that Boston would have to touch it and get the clock started early, but it is just seven seconds here. And we'll see what Cooper elects to do with it. He's just going to toss it back to Herskew. Herskew will throw it back to Cooper. They're just going to play catch. <laughs> and that's the way the game will come to a close. 24 to 20. Philadelphia wins and improves to 7 and 1. Boston falls to 5 and 2. And Philadelphia in the driver's seat for the home field advantage in the playoffs. We're going to step away and come down and break this one down when we get back. was a huge loss. I just decided to launch and try to get it. I knew if I went up early enough, I could get it. And all of a sudden, there are feet kind of above heads. Does it all come back to this loss? Does it all come back to this play? If I had four hands, I'd put all four hands on the board. It was up the other line. They had to deliver. Boston kept doing this thing that we didn't think was possible. Back here at Cary Stadium, 24 to 20, your final score. The spinners over the Whitecaps. And as I said, in the driver's seat for that home field advantage in the playoffs. And we've got our player of the game down on the sideline. It's Vince Radoms. Congratulations on the win, Vince. Hey, thank you very much. So uh, we, we saw you seem to step into the offensive role there uh, as a result of maybe meta being out. How did that feel to get out and get so much run with the, uh, with the offense today? Uh, it feels good. Um, obviously, we get a lot of reps with the, uh, the O-line and uh, <laughs> <laughs> practice on a regular basis. So, yep. uh, you know, fluid transition there. Uh, obviously, missing um, Himalaya is a, a, a big loss. Uh, so we're just trying to hold up uh, what, what he usually does for us. Yeah, we saw that everybody seems to be doing the, the meta celebration. Uh, was that planned on you guys? Was, that ev was everybody just doing that individually? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it was planned, but definitely honoring a, a great player and uh, hoping he gets well soon. Yeah, and speaking of getting well soon, I mean, you guys are setting yourselves up for a uh, good end of the season here and possibly home field advantage. Uh, was that something that you were specifically excited about in this game? Absolutely. Um, you know, we had the uh, tough loss there against uh, Boston, um, you know, a couple weeks ago, and that was uh, big on our minds. So coming here, uh, holding home field and, and looking forward to, to getting home field advantage later is uh, really important to us. And we saw you get out of this game today with five goals and one assist, which uh, that's five goals and you had six goals coming into the game, so it's a big game on your part, but tell us a little bit about how you plan to get those end of quarter and end of half plays. Um, end of half plays, uh, you know, I, I got a little bit of height, so I try and use that <laughs> to my advantage uh, whenever possible, but uh, obviously we got uh, some, some great throwers um, in, uh, in Migs throwing that, that deep one earlier. Uh, just glad they have some trust in me, and I'll, I'll try and go up and get them when I can. Yeah, you seem to have been earning that trust today in the way that you played uh, running downfield, making space happen. Uh, but this is the first year that you guys have gone two and one against the Whitecaps to win the season series. How good does that feel? Oh, uh, always feels great to get a win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing you during the rest of the season. Uh, we'll get to see you guys in the playoffs. Hopefully, it'll be home field advantage for you down here in Philly. And it was great performance out there today. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, being up there in the booth and look forward to next time. Yeah, thanks for your time. All right, have a good one. Congrats to Vince. Congrats to Vince and the rest of the spinners. We're going to step away once more, come back. One final breakdown of this one.
Final time back here at Cary Stadium, 24 to 20. The spinners go on to defeat the Whitecaps. They take the season series two to one, both times around the home team takes the victor. And when it's possible, we'll see the Whitecaps back down here once more, but there's still work to be done on both sides. Boston will get right back at it tomorrow in a very important game now against New York. And Philadelphia's just got to close out the season strong. Yeah, and this is, you could tell the entire season that this is what Philadelphia was building towards. They had, a, they had a sense of purpose and a single-mindedness about them this season that they were lacking in the previous season. It has to do with the early season results. It has to do with the way that their defense has been so aggressive, both when they're playing defense and right after the turn, attacking their opponents. And the way that they've played and the way that they've used their entire roster this season a little bit better than they had in the past it's a testament to the team, it's a testament to the staff, and I'm excited to see them in the playoffs. I'm excited to see how they close out the rest of the season. Should be interesting to see the way this finishes out. Again, join us tomorrow, four o'clock start, in Orange, New Jersey, as the Whitecaps and the Rumble go head to head. But that's gonna do it for us here tonight as part of our week nine coverage. It's not <laughs> over yet. Check out the Western Conference games going on tonight. But that'll do it. Their final score, 24 to 20, the Spinners over the Whitecaps. On behalf of Dusty Rhodes and the rest of us here at the MLU, I'm Jeff Poster. We'll see you tomorrow in New York.